Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Uh, today is June the 23rd, 2019. And um, yeah, I'm trying out a new crew. I, I fired Rollick and, and all those guys. So I wondered. I wondered what happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. I've got John Langan, Larry Barron, and Paul Trimbley here. So. So, no, guys, I know they're listening, too. I'm just kidding. I'm lucky to have the guys I have. So uh, they, all wanted, they all wanted a pay raise, which I couldn't do. So <laughs> anyway. How could, how could you what? pay Pete Rollick what he's worth? You could not. That's why I pay him nothing. So, uh, yeah, on the show, we've got uh, Laird Barron, Paul Trimbley, and John Legan. Hey, guys. Hey, Mike. Hey, everybody. Hey, Mike. Thanks for being on the show. Um, sure. Before we go further, I should thank my new sponsor, uh, Mount Olive Dill Pickles. For, uh, <laughs> That's it. This interview is over. <laughs> Somebody's getting Already. paid. <laughs> the boss gets paid. <laughs> the best pickles. Yeah. Now, I, I can understand people hating sweet pickles. Oh, my God. They're awful. But dill pickles, dill pickles are great, man. So, all I can say is Stephen Graham Jones is on my no pickles team, and it's. I know oh. I invited him to come to this podcast, but John said no, I will not be on a podcast with Stephen Graham Jones. <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm, I'm not sharing time with Stephen Graham Jones. Come on. Yeah, we have, we have standards. So, yeah, uh, you know, Stephen is way above those standards. This is true. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, let's do a bit of an introduction i'll my i'm mike davis with lovecraft easing um and why don't you guys take a couple minutes and for that one guy in southern texas who doesn't know who you are um uh, talk talk about um tell, tell me your bio i guess how about you go first john um hi guy in southern texas uh <laughs> i'm uh I'm John Langan. Um, I, uh, I've written a number of novels and short story collections. Uh, my new collection is called Sephira and Other Betrayals out from Hippocampus Press. Um, I think at this point I'm probably best known for a novel called The Fisherman, uh, which came out in 2016. Um, it won the Bram Stoker uh, Award. And um, I also uh, review horror and, and dark fantasy for Locust Magazine. And uh, I'm a high school teacher. I teach high school English um, at the New York Military Academy. Yeah. Do you see his part face part. crinkle up when he said I teach high school? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what, what grades do you teach? Uh, 10th and 12th. 10th uh, oh, okay. grade, uh, sophomore English and, and um, senior English. Oh, you and, you and my wife are doing the exact same thing then. So, she teaches various grades, teaches English. She's doing God's work. That's right. Uh, it's unbelievable the pay gap between teachers and the football coach and the superintendent, you know? So. Right, 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 right. <laughs> okay, Laird. Hey, uh, this is going out to that same guy in <laughs> Southern Texas. Uh, my name's Laird Barron, and I write crime. Crime novels, never horror, nothing fantastical. <laughs> Rhyme. Um, I have written some short stories uh, that were mostly crime. <laughs> the, cro the, croning, as I, the croning, as I remember, was a really noir crime mystery. So, yeah. exactly, exactly. It's a coming of age and uh, kind of a, kind of like on Golden Pond, but with black magic and machetes. Yeah, exactly. But okay. no, uh, yeah. yeah, that's that. That's it. That's all we That's it. You, you, uh, oh, yes, your publicist called, said we could not discuss anything except for crime in this interview in regards to you. I mean, so, uh, Paul. Uh, I look forward to Laird's upcoming novel, The Crime in <laughs> next year. Uh, so I guess my bio is for the gentleman looming over Laird's shoulder right now and, um, John's mom, the two people who aren't aware of me. Yeah, there you go. Right, come on, somebody. Anyway, hi, I'm Paul Tremblay. Uh, I just made a really bad joke. Uh, I am the author. My most recent novels with William Morrow, uh, the f I guess the first of the three novels that I've had published with them recently. These are horror novels. The first one was called The Head Full of Ghosts, which is sort of a 
I don't know, a 21st century riff on The Exorcist. Uh, the year after that came Disappearance to Devil's Rock, which was sort of a, uh, you know, a missing teen sort of story. Last summer was The Cabin at the End of the World, which was, I guess, my take on the home invasion subgenre. And uh, coming out in about eight days is a short story collection called Growing Things and Other Stories. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that. I'll look for that. Um, and I teach high school as well. I teach high school math still. Wow. Not right now because it's summer. L uh, Laird, who do you teach? I'm trying to I'm trying to teach this dog not to hate my guts. <laughs> my uh, my girlfriend has a beautiful border collie, but she's like a kind of a one person dog. So I spend a lot of time with her though because I'm home. I work from home, and my girlfriend works part time from home, and the rest of the time at a library. And so. Uh, I have to try to try to get along with the dog, but she's awfully smart and temperamental. So we're uh, kind of learning to co you know, to kind of coexist. Okay. Um, I, John told me earlier that he was on the podcast, what, a few weeks ago, John? And yeah, I posted, yeah, about like a month, month and a half ago or yeah, something. Yeah. I know, I, I aren't you guys getting sick of him yet? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I no, that was my question, audition. Who who would win in a fight between the three of you? And John, John just said that the <laughs> four are UK. Uh, well, who was it? Was it Paul? I don't remember who it was. That th this is horror UK. They asked the same question. Oh, yeah, they, it's making the rounds. So, which is um, the reason we're here right now is to settle this question. Yeah. Uh, well, like allegedly. <laughs> Well, look at the size of my freakish fist. I think I would win. Look how big it is. <laughs> look, I, I said it. I thought I put this to rest weeks ago. Yes. If, if we were to fight, the enemies of the North would win. So I don't think that uh, I don't think it's going to happen. No, I would only fight for these two gentlemen. Never against. <laughs> okay, so what what I would do is I would say, <laughs> look. A New York Times review, and when they both turned, I would run them up and hit them from behind. Uh, and that's right. why I would win. Good strategy. Yeah. Or, well, um, or it's why you would hit us. So you you guys, you three are allegedly friends. Um, <laughs> how did you guys meet? Where and how did you guys meet? Well, um, I think in some ways it starts with me. Um, of course. When uh, um, I published my first story in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, um, uh, whatever it was, like August of 2001, I think, Laird published his first story in, in FNSF in September of 2001. And Gordon Van Gelder sent me an email and he said, You got to check out this guy. You got to check out this story. It's really weird. I think you'll appreciate it. So I read it, he and didn't I don't say remember. It was good. He just said it was weird. Oh yeah, it's just like, and I don't know if, um, honestly, I don't know if I contacted Laird then or if it was after I read the the Imago sequence. But so we were in contact with one another, and then Paul and I met at ReaderCon, um, maybe about two thousand five. I think it was. We were on a panel together, and the panel was called something like you know horror that isn't. It, it was sort of like horror stories that fly under the radar or something like that. And Paul was there with his um, his his first collection, Compositions for the Young and Old, had just been re released in in hardcover with this introduction by Stuart O'Nan that he could not stop talking about. <laughs> and <laughs> the whole that, that, the end that of the guy. panel. The end of the Just, panel, he was like, "Will anyone buy this?" And I was like, "Here you go, I paid full price for it." You know? um, and then he, he, paid, he paid more than full price. He kept emailing me, you know. That, and he was like, that guy just, just to interrupt real quick. That guy wrote one of my favorite books. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. the Night Country, absolutely. And the, oh, yeah. the opening to that is one of the best openings I've ever read in any novel. Yeah, yeah, so. and we just, you know, I, I mean, we just we we saw each other at ReaderCon. Um, the, the three of us and, and, um, we were at, um, world fantasy in Saratoga, maybe 2007. I think that was, yeah. and you know, was it was say, right before that one of those reader cons, I know I had you both over for like, a you know, my, you came to my house before reader con for a little barbecue, Larry oh, terrorized right. my children. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I couldn't make it there uh, for some. I did. I couldn't no, make it just Laird then. Yeah, it was. It was. I dropped off Laird, and you were. I like, was trying to steal Laird from you. Yeah, I've always, been playing, I've always been playing catch up. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And it just kind of, you know, I, I just, we always sort of got along with each other and we've, we traveled to different conventions together and done readings together. And um, it's just one of those weird kind of things that I always felt like these guys uh, for pretty early on were like the, you know, the other brothers I didn't know I didn't have. Come on, John, hug it out. <laughs> Stay away from me. Stay away. <laughs> Tell him, mom. Uh, anything you guys I, want to add to that? I, I don't remember any of those. <laughs> <laughs> Blair's agent set us up on a date. No, the I, yeah, I mean, I John, John and I corresponded quite a bit back in the early aughts, and then that's about right. We met at 2007 uh, at ReaderCon when I met both of them for the first time. It was, I think that's when we all met in person. We've been talking, you know, we've been emailing and on the phone and stuff like that. Prior to that, um, we all used to hang out uh, on the uh, nightshade uh, message boards like with Lucia Shepard and Jeff Ward. And that was a real happening place for a few years. I talked to a lot of uh, authors there. And but the three of us, we, yeah, we chatted quite a bit. And um, and then, yeah, we met we met at ReaderCon. And uh, that's also where we were talking about sharing, you know, which has come to fruition, you know, sharing various story elements. Not so much story ideas, but just like little pieces I was working on, I can't remember if, it was, if, if I was the one starting with it, but we, we were talking at that first reader con about the black guy. Right. And I, I, I think it was me. I think I said, hey, I'm writing the story. And it was, you know, and we were talking about what the different manifestations the black guy could take. That in one story could be a pamphlet somebody finds while they're in France on a bus, you know, it's just, or on the back know. of a, or the back of an airplane. You know how you, you had the magazines of the, the seat backs of the, air, you know, the airplane. And, uh, or as it manifested in my story, it was um, you know like an almanac traveler's guide uh, that, you, that that they found in a uh, sporting goods you know an old one of those antique sporting goods Salvation Army style stores. And so we were talking about each of us should have you know do a story and, and have that black guide appear in the story, and, uh, and we have. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, no, you know where the black eyed came from actually was was my wife and I had been in um, Provence in 2002 for a convention, and we had the um, the Michelin guide, the the green guide that they have, Le Guide Vert, and a friend of ours told us about this thing called Le Guide Noir, the black guide, and it was a guide to all the just kind of weird places in in Provence, like you know, former that there was supposed to be a a beast of Provence that had come out of one river or another and i just thought man this is like just an awesome thing to and it's one of those things you know as a writer sometimes something falls into your into your lap and you're like i don't know what i'm going to do with this right away but i got to just hang on to it and um and yeah then we were talking about it and laird was like bang i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna do something with this and well, it's, it's because what's all well, I, I don't know i can't remember quite the details but there's two different things that i've seen like i've never seen anything quite like the black guy as we've done it in the stories but I have seen like there's New York weird and yeah, yeah. weird. In other words, they're kind of slick. They have a table of contents. They don't purport to be, although I guess they could be real. But I mean, they're they're more just like oh, you know, in this in this Ulster County, there's the Great Pumpkin or whatever like that, that kind of thing. Like it's obviously like a like a like a tourism thing, but not necessarily anything like in the know. So what we were talking about doing was taking that kind of general idea. And taking it from kind of like a tourist attraction, you know, a guide to tourist attractions, and turning it into an actual like this weird, like there's handwritten stuff in it. It may be copied, you know, like photocopy, but like almost incomprehensible because there's so many different people. And then obviously, if you get different editions of it, they may not even be the same. Like in other words, information may be different from even within the same uh, black guide. I think John did one that the black guide manifested as. Uh, a uh, website. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Blackguide.com. Yeah, and it shut down the computer, and oh, it didn't work, and then well, it worked. So yeah, but that that was just—I mean, that's not like a big deal, but it was definitely something we were sitting around drinking, refuse, you know. <laughs> no way. Yeah, and uh, and we were chatting about uh, something we could do. You kind of, and John and I have done quite a bit of that over the years, actually, put, putting little. Not each other Drinking. in stories. That's it. Well, yeah, but um, 
but sh you know, sharing like little de like little details from stories, especially if we're going to be in the same mythology, they have like little sneaky things in there. So, although it does it does remind me, I don't know if you guys remember, but one of those first reader cons, it was first or the second, and Laird was doing a reading. <laughs> and so Paul and and Laird and I, and I think Jack Haringa went to. Um, was it Chili's or, or one of those kind of restaurants? So we go to Chili's for dinner before the reading. And uh, Laird, of course, appears cool as a cucumber. And so Paul and Jack and I order whatever our, our dinners were. And Laird just says, oh, I'll, you know, bring me like a whiskey. Um, and the waitress is like, okay. And by the end of the meal, I think he'd gone through like six or seven whiskeys. And the waitress was just like, another one? And he was like, yeah, but you couldn't see any difference in his in his behavior. <laughs> and we had our burrito surprises or whatever, you know. And the end of the meal, Laird was like, right, I'm ready. And and he did. He went and, and read. Uh, then his liver exploded. Oh, so that was the, uh, I read The Forest. It was a gorilla reading. We had gone to Michael Sisko. He had a, he had a reading earlier in the day. That was the first time I'd ever uh I read Michael Cisco, but I'd never heard him read, and that was great. So, yeah, and I, I was doing pretty well. I was mentally functional, but I couldn't I, I couldn't walk. <laughs> I remember Paul is on one side, my two tall friends, my new tall friends. They, uh, they, they actually carried me, sort of carried me to the, like I, they each had me under an arm, and we were just chatting, and they took me, and they leaned me up against the podium, and I, I looked like I was being casual, but I actually couldn't move. I was just sort of stuck. <laughs> To the podium, and I I read this I read you know an excerpt of the forest and um, yeah it was good times. <laughs> I love they, time. they, they wouldn't schedule or they hadn't scheduled us for a reading right so we decided to commandeer a reading a, a room, and we sort of convinced whoever was in the rooms were already locked but we convinced someone in the hotel staff that this was just an error and we got them to unlock the room. Um, and we, we made a little sign that said, you know, guerrilla reading, why go to sleep when your nightmares are already here? And, um, and yeah, we got a pretty good little crowd who were like, oh, all right, sure, I'll go to this. Yeah, it was that fun. And seems to be very inebriated. <laughs> yeah, that, was, fun. that was actually going to be one of my questions to you guys about the Black Guide and other Easter eggs. Um, are, there, can, are there any other examples besides the Black Guide that you can share that well, people would... look, look for? Sure. Well, I would say briefly, like, uh, one thing, actually, the first thing I did with the Black Guide, I, I don't know if both of those guys are aware, John might be, but I actually, at my high school, I had a fledgling creative writing club. Like, it, I remember that, yeah. it lasted for like a couple of years, but it more depended on the enthusiasm of the students that were in it. Uh, but the first year I did it, like, the kids were really into it, and, you know, I had the kids do a group project, and they were all supposed to do entries of the Black Guide, um, you know, however they interpreted that to be. Um, I think it's still up on my blog somewhere, uh, you know, what the students had wrote. And I wrote something about a, like a British style um, telephone booth that appears and, and disappears in different places. And every time you mention the black eyed, Laird's dog barks. No, no, that's my dog. Or it's one of my dog. Dog. Oh, geez. Okay. There's no dog, Paul. You're just hearing things. Oh, my gosh. There are four lights. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but sorry, it's really a question about other Easter eggs. Yeah, oh yeah. I, don't know. I mean, I think Laird is sort of like the king of tuckerizing people. I don't know if he's the king, but he does it a lot. John too. All right, there's a big difference between being the king and doing it a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> I do a lot of things a lot. Um, being no. the king implies you do it well. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> or the best, right? <laughs> um, no, I just do it a lot. Uh, yeah. I've snuck a few things in. I'm actually, actually, Paul doesn't know about something, but someone get into that. But, uh, oh boy, <laughs> stay tuned. Um, no, uh, one, like one of the ones I can think of. Just they're just little things. But I wrote a story a few years ago uh, to Christopher Golden, and he had a, a, a Simon and Schuster anthology, uh, Seize the Night. So it was a vampire anthology, and. I wrote a story in there uh, about this creature, and basically the, the the method the creature lures people is by calling for help. And the the story starts off. It's kind of a, there's a flashback to the '70s and this the woman telling the story like when she was a teenager. There was this remote setting in Alaska, this like really remote fishing town, mining town, and they're out looking for the dog in the middle of the night. The dog's name is is Orlando. Tony Orlando. Paul. 
It's the dog there's, a reason, there's a reason for why the parents named the dog that kind of hokey name. And then, and then uh, John is also in that anthology. And I believe there's a, there's a, there's a point in the story uh, where, the, where the protagonist is like in this sort of a dungeon, kind of a supernatural dungeon. And he hears someone, you know, uh, I believe. And also, also there's an Orlando, an Orlando dog in that. So, you know, if you could yeah. do the anthology, you wouldn't even, you might catch the fact that there are two dogs named Orlando. Like yours is Orlando Bloom. But, uh, <laughs> right, but the help me might, the help me thing might slip by. But we've done quite a few of those actually over the years. Well, and also, I mean, I mean, Paul did, um, Paul wrote a story called House of Windows, uh, which was the name of my first novel. True. Um, and um, and no one knows this. I, I actually I don't know if anybody knows this, right? That in the in the original draft of of Head Full of Ghosts, um, yeah, the father right. and mother were named John and Sarah Langan. Um, and Sarah and I are no relation, nor were we married. But you know, <laughs> there was this whole meta thing that went on in the manuscript. And someday, some lucky graduate student is going to find that manuscript and is going to be like jackpot. <laughs> well, I, I think the cool stuff is is less the Tuckerizations, which have been going on forever. I think yeah. the neat to me the, the stuff that I that I enjoy the most and probably people won't catch on to uh, are the little like the, like the help me thing or the or the recurrence of a dog named Orlando or the fact that the the broken ring uh, old Leech's broken ring actually originally comes from just this one comment that John had there's a comment in his story on Spoo Island where this archaeologist I believe is an archaeologist is looking at like this ancient, you know, Norwegian uh, or some kind of Scandinavian writing or cuneiform something. I can't remember. But there's a symbol of like a worm. And I was like, we were talking. I said, hey, can I do something with that? He's like, sure, sure, go ahead. And initially it wasn't going to be a big deal. It was just going to be same thing with the black guy, just something that was going to be in a story. And maybe Paul would do it and, you know, the three of us would do it. Maybe somebody else would come along and do it, big deal. But then it, but then it became like this core at least in my case, it became a, a kind of a core, a, a part, a core part of a whole line of stories. So you just never know what's, you know, you never know what's going to happen. You know, it's funny, Mike. Uh, one of the things I love about Laird and John, especially like as writers, you know, on the, unfortunately now it gets to be a little bit more rare that the three of us are all together at the same time. But you know, these two guys are almost like uh, when they're together, not a comedy duo because they're writing horror, but like the ideas they come up with so quickly. Um, it was something that I'm envious of, but at the same time, I love watching them just like riff and be creative, like on the spot. Because it takes me much longer, for, you know, to do stuff like that. I mean, a fun one of my favorite examples was uh, I don't know if was it after a convention. I, I can't remember why, but they were both at my house, and so we went to uh, Salem. I took them to Salem, Massachusetts, which is a fairly short drive from my house. I was like, oh, we have to go to Count Orlock's Nightmare Gallery. Um, I like many things. <laughs> And like many things in our relationships, you know, Laird is usually, ah, oh, we're not going to do that. Yeah, that's going to stink. <laughs> First, I'm like, no, Laird, it'll be good. We'll do it. So we do it. And, it, and um, I actually, it was for me because I'd been there before, like watching those two guys in there. I mean, it was almost like watching two, you know, kids coming down for Christmas or something. Um, it's, it's not quite a, a wax museum, but they have uh, sort of like mannequins or art sculptures of all these different, you know, movie monster figures and uh for dracula it would, be, it would be featured in a stephen king like a section of a stephen king story where the kids talking about in the 50s or 60s is talking about going to something like this it's that yeah. cool it's it's Definitely. terrific it's really really it's a terrific place um but so the first time the three of us were there and actually i think it's the only time those two have been there they had i think it was lugosi's dracula uh but there was a story there about a, a dracula ring and instantly, like, Larry was like, oh, like, I'm going to write this. And he already had, like, this elaborate, almost, like, plot, just unfurl, just from reading, like, five minutes about this concept of the Dracula ring. I know he's used a little bit. And, uh, John, right, you're working on a story now that is sort of Oh, yeah, on the it's, all about, it's all about the Dracula ring. And that was the, you know, that, that you, it's absolutely true that, that what's, what's so great about, about hanging out with these guys, you know, talking to, we, we talk on the phone all the time and email and that sort of stuff is, is that... Um, yeah, sometimes you're just complaining. You're just like, oh my God, it's, you know, it's so hot. Uh, my feet hurt. Um, but sometimes you're you're also just, you start to bat ideas around, you know, and, and that's just a, a great deal of fun. That's, um, you're like, you're playing in the sandbox together, you know, and, and there's a lot of, and I, I, 
don't know how to put this, you know, but but like I, I feel like a lot of writers today are very nervous about their kind of intellectual property and and with good reason. Um, uh, but but it's it's nice to be able to do that. It's nice to be able to have some people you 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 sort of trust enough that you can just kick ideas around with and say, well, what if you did this or what if you did that or, you know, if I'm having trouble with the story, sometimes I'll sit down and I'll I'll talk it out with Paul or I'll talk it out with Laird and, and I'll say, well, you know, this is what I'm trying to do, you know, and and I mean, fair enough. Most of the time, they're they're both just like, what what were you saying? But still, it makes me feel better to have, to have talked to them. Yeah, you guys are actually doing a great job of uh, answering questions before I ask them today, because one of my questions... <laughs> We're all so psychic when you bring yes, us together. Right. We have the ESP. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, was, it was something along the lines of, what do you guys feel that you owe each other in terms of writing? So $10. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that's a lot. <laughs> uh, by the way, Kat, Pulver is watching this live, and she writes on the uh, Insta chat next to the YouTube video. This episode does not need a moderator. Give them five minutes, and Mike can get some well-deserved rest. <laughs> so, um, so, okay, so uh, one thing I'll, I'll say, right? Yeah. Is many years ago, um, uh, when sci fiction was uh, the the online uh, website was a was a thing, right? Um, it it when it uh, was canceled, when the Sci Fi Channel decided they didn't want to have sci fiction anymore, all these people took part in something called the uh, it was the Ellen Datlow Sci Fiction Project or something like that, and they wrote appreciations of stories that had been on there. This is just a preamble because I wrote a, an appreciation of of Laird's story Bulldozer, and one of the things I said was that Laird keeps me honest, and and this is how I feel about him and Paul is that when I when I look at my own work and I compare it to somebody, you know, like, like say Peter Straub, right? Or, or even the, the late, great Lucius Shepard. And I think, oh, I'm not as good as those guys are. You know, I can kind of let myself off the hook because I'm like, oh, but Peter's been doing this for half a century, you know? Don't worry about it, man. But then when I read Laird's stuff or Paul's stuff and I'm like, son of a gun, those guys are, you know, they're my contemporaries and look at how good they are. Look at, look at how restless they are. You know, the, the, either one of them, I, I think could just stay still, could just keep repeating what it is that, that, that made them famous, you know, in the first place. And that would be fine. But it's like with every, sometimes with every new story, they, they're, you see them pushing themselves into these new directions and into, into, you know, what if I, you know, in Laird's case, what if I wrote a crime novel, you know? Um, and um, in, in Paul's case, these, these kind of crazy books that are, are, you know, especially the, the most recent one, Cabin at the End of the World, that, that is, is so much um, a thriller, but also very much about our contemporary, you know, our moment in time. Um, and and so I I look at those uh, I look at those books and I look at these guys and I I just think I have to do better, uh, which sometimes don't get me wrong it's a pain in the butt you know sometimes I'm just like I don't want to do better I just wanna I want to be lazy, um, but that's really important you know that's really important to have um, people whose whose example is is kind of urging you on to to do better yourself you know. Well. Well, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Paul. Sorry. Um, well, I was going to say, so when I first met them, both John and Laird did nothing for me. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, oh, we have stories in fantasy and science fiction magazine. You got nothing. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, I mean, it was true. You, you had nothing. No, go on. I had nothing, yeah. You st you guys, so you started in the friendship, friendship by being a groupie, is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> a, a hanger on. <laughs> Um, no, we I mean, had that shirt, Paul, with our faces on it. Yeah, I, I cannot, I can't, you know, jokes aside, I can't put a value or you know what I owe them. Uh, you know, I, I owe them, I, I feel like I could say I could owe them everything. I mean, particularly with a head full of ghosts, uh, like so it was 2013, I was 100 pages into a different novel that wasn't going very well at all. Um, and then I had the idea for that novel. And it was really, it was hard. I mean, I was super excited about the story of A Head Full of Ghosts, but, um, you know, quitting that other book and after having my two crime novels not do very well, I was definitely at like a low ebb of confidence, you know, and not sure if I could do, you know, much of anything. 
um, you know, and the whole time I was writing that book, I was talking to both of them. I, you know, I still remember so many of the conversations. Um, you know, some of it was even like <laughs> about like representation. I mean, some of it was like, it was everything that I was worried about um, and not even just on a story level. So, um, you know, for that book, some of my fondest memories of writing that book are the discussions I've had, you know, with Laird and John while it was going on. Um, no, I mean, like, as John said, I, I, I hope, I hope other writers out there have, you know, people that they feel like they're working with together and not against. And I, there's never been a moment, you know, even early on in our friendship where I ever like worried, oh, like I'm going to be judged a certain way by John or Laird. That's not to say that they don't, you know, that's not to say they're going to like everything I write, but I think whatever they're going to tell me is going to be fair. Um, I don't know. I think that's kind of hard to find. Yeah. Laird, anything to add? No. 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 Okay. No, okay. Next no. question. <laughs> <laughs> no, He's like, these two um, hangers on. No, I get nothing out of this. <laughs> no, actually, no, it's the opposite. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of. I have a I have a pretty small group of people that I consider close friends, and I have a much larger group of people that I'm really friendly with and are friends on a you know kind of a different level. But uh, I feel lucky. I feel I feel really lucky actually that over the years my circle of writer friends and editor friends and publisher friends have actually edged into that actual friend you know sort of designation uh, going both ways. And but these two are among my very closest friends. You know, uh, anywhere I don't, I don't, and I don't even really make a uh, differ. I don't really differentiate my writing life from my the stuff that I do that doesn't involve writing. Just pretty much writing is everything that I do for the last twenty years. You know, I, I kind of have a my Alaska my my Alaska life, which was, but it was it was still writing. It was, um, you know, I, I only out of, out of almost it's forty nine years now. I think I have eight years I didn't. You know, eight to twelve. Well, about twelve years I didn't write when I was a little tiny child, and uh, a few years in my twenties when I was racing the uh, Diderot and just sort of struggling to stay alive, to be honest. And then when I moved to Washington State, there was a couple of years there where I wrote, but it was nonfiction. It was I did a lot of st studying, kind of catching up, uh, and self improvement kind of kind of thing. And I went from worrying about taking care of a dog team, kind of like a farmer or a rancher, where everything everything in your mind it's always outward it's always what's the weather going to be like how are the dogs doing you know there was very little i it was always we and then so there was a few years there where i was able to actually catch up on the on the on the me stuff but since then you know around 20 years now uh, writing has been my my primary my primary identity and these guys are a big part of it um in ways that are far far more important and granular than you know, even sharing the, you know, it's like to me, the black guy's an interesting story to talk about that we did, or I tuckerized them in something. It's more the, it's more the Count Orlock stuff and the stuff, the fact that, you know, Paul took us and show, showed us that. And, you know, I am, I am kind of a curmudgeon. You know, I'm like, ah, I go out and see people. There's going to be people there. You know, they won't like it if I bring a bottle in. Get off my lawn. <laughs> a little, a little bit. You know, I, I was, I lived, I lived alone for many, many years. And uh, I was talking to my girlfriend here recently about that. I'm kind of, in some ways, I've, I've kind of gone full circle. I'm, I'm sort of going back to being more of a, uh, I won't say a hermit, but kind of withdrawing a little bit because it's just, that's just what I did for almost 15, 15 years of my life. And it really ingrained itself. But, um, these guys are really important to me for like just for the friendship the, the writing of course that goes without saying i have you know i think part of the reason that i uh am such you know i feel like they're such great friends is because i admire them uh, as writers i i would have a hard time you know being really close friends with somebody that I didn't admire for something it doesn't have to be writing but i have to admire them as people and i admire these two guys uh, and you know that, that that's a big deal. Paul or uh, John and I, uh, it hasn't happened since my dog died. I really, you know, I haven't gotten out a lot actually. But we used to up until just you know this last year or so. Every summer or autumn, we would spend a few weeks, um, you know, watching. Uh, you know, I would come over once a week. We'd have a couple drinks and watch Samurai, 
films, or we would get on a kick where we'd watch various, you know, Japanese or Korean directors and, and follow their film filmography. You know, oh, this in the fifties he was doing samurai films, and in the sixties he he migrated to gangster films. This one's actually like sort of a drama romance kind of a thing, and you know, it all it. <clears throat> it's all it's all really important and just it's stuff that makes up a life but these guys have been a huge part of my life in a fundamental way for many years you yeah, know uh, there's, there's yeah, um ahead, well, i'm sorry just that there's a um an essay that that peter Stroud <laughs> wrote about um the first time he met stephen king uh when king Stroud was still living in in england and uh, the kings came to visit they were thinking maybe they'd relocate to um to England and um, and what always what what I remember most of all from that essay was him talking about how there was he he felt in uh, Straub found in Stephen King this tremendous source um, and this tremendous feeling of integrity that this was a guy who was taking what he was doing seriously and I, I think really with with yeah with with both Paul and 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 Laird there is there's this tremendous sense of integrity to what they're doing. And no matter what it is, no matter what it is that they're that they're writing, whether it's crime or horror or an essay or or what have you, that there's there's never a sense for me that they're taking the easy way out, that they're winking at the at the reader. Yeah, I know this is all kind of garbage, but whatever, you know. It's it's all done with the the utmost integrity. And I think um obviously I really respect that as a reader, but then also as a writer too, because of course, I, I I like to think that's what like I'm trying to do my own work with integrity. And so when you see other people doing the same thing, it helps. It it helps you feel like oh okay good I'm not I'm not the only lunatic who's 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 trying to um, to do this to the to the best of his ability. And um, yeah, you know it's it's kind of funny because I think in in like here we are on the show together, right? And who would win in a fight and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and and we have become, and I'm very pleased by that, that we become associated with one another because I think this will ensure my literary immortality is that I'll be associated with them, you know? Um, Reflective but, glory. Yeah. Exactly, right, exactly. They're always like, well, they used to talk about this Langan guy. We better check him out too, you know? Um, my grandchildren will reap the rewards of this, you know? But... Um, but but it just sort of happens like like uh, our our friendship our our um, our relationship as writers it all just kind of happened very naturally there was nothing um, like sort of premeditated about it you know no, it wasn't nobody like, else would talk to us at a convention so it was well like, it was that yeah yeah it was like, how are you guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> right it was it, <laughs> we were we weren't on any panels together we were just like let's go sit in the bar together and drink away our sorrows <laughs> speaking of that is that beer you're drinking I... no no that's just water oh okay yeah. uh, it looks like moonshine <laughs> well, you, you did it to me again, John, because I was going to bring up Stephen King and Peter Straub. Uh, you know, these guys are friends, and they've collaborated on a on a book several times. Is that something that any of you three have thought about or talked about doing at some point in the future? Oh, yeah. It just it hasn't. I've never collaborated. The, the only collaboration I've done is I, I, I worked on it, and I can't go into details, but I worked on a screenplay. Uh, with Steven my, Spielberg. Well, okay. <laughs> All right, it's out now. Yeah. Then your Spielberg, go, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, there's a there's a writer I really admire, a friend of mine that we we did something together. But it was on it was on his, it was screenplay, and he did the lion's share of the work. And uh, but as far as collaborating, uh, you know, on a novel or a novella or something like that, something we talked that we have talked about, just does not it just has not come to fruition. Yeah, I know John and I years ago actually talked about writing like a sort of a fun story about I don't want to say maybe we'll still do it. I don't know. No, no, I I, I have that. That's that's absolutely like it's it's sort of funny that that, that project is still absolutely <laughs> one that I want to get to. Yeah, it involves the creature of the black lagoon. I don't want anyone to steal our idea. Right. Um, yeah, no, Laird and I had we had talked about it, and I, I was like, we should write a story. What should we write about? And Laird was like, Godzilla versus Cthulhu, like without missing a beat, you know. I, I know I've told this story before, and then after a little bit of time, he was like, Nah, nah, that's kind of it's been done. And 
we were going to write a story at one point that um, was going to be about Frankenstein's monster. You know, at the at the very end of, of Frankenstein, when um, uh, I think it's Frankenstein himself reveals how the monster killed his 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 bride on their wedding night. Um, he talks about having pursued the monster like around the globe for years, trying to catch him. And so it was going to be a like a like a kind of kind of a chase narrative in a way, but that was the you know it was going to be who knew where in some jungle outpost or something like that where the monster is actually being pursued by by um, by Frankenstein, and then we kind of let that fall by the wayside. So um, eventually, it'll probably be a touching story of two middle aged people, two middle aged men who are just trying to find their way in this world. Old, yeah. Well, yeah. Are we old. So, uh, it, you know, writing is hard, and you guys, two of you guys have regular jobs, you're teachers. Um, what made you get, say, I want to be a writer, I want to do this? Um, how did that begin for each of you? Um, all right, I guess I'll go first. Uh, so I, I feel like I came to just even the idea of reading for pleasure later than most. I mean, I'll try to make this brief, because I, I I've talked about this in other places before, but... I mean, I was a mathematics major in college, and I went to graduate school for you know to get my master's in math. Um, but actually, while I was in Vermont getting my master's in math, um, that's where I fell in love with reading. Right before I went up, I had read Joyce Carol Oates' "Where Are You Going? Where Are You Been?" for like a random English class that I ended up taking. Um, and like a week or two after that, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, bought me Stephen King's "The Stand" for my birthday, and um, those two things just turned me into a reader. Like so. While I was up in the wilds of Vermont struggling to get my master's degree, I was also, I read all the King I could get, you know, and Troy Jackson, and I used Dance Macabre really as like a list, um, you know, Peter Straub, et cetera. So when I got out of grad school and I got a teaching job that's, you know, later that summer, I also had like this weird itch to try writing a story. So in a weird way, <laughs> you know, my life as a writer is totally tied to my professional career as a teacher because I've never done one without the other. There's never been a point where I've been teaching in not writing like they sort of both started at the same time so well i i do have a goal of you know one day being able to do it full time part of me is really nervous <laughs> about it um because it would be a totally new experience for me john do you want to jump in with that yeah i i mean on, on the one hand um I was, it's funny because i'm still thinking about that that peter straub stephen king thing maybe we'll come yeah. back to that um because peter because they've both been really important to, to all of us, I think, and and are are worth Peter. I mean, Peter just gave the three of us this lovely shout out the other week that was just completely unexpected. And I saw that. Him. That was really yeah, yeah. Um, but but no, um, yeah. I um, I used to. I, I still do. But but I for, 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 I love to draw, and for me, that was the root into storytelling was was drawing. Um, when I was in uh, grade school, most of what I was reading, I, I was a tremendous reader, but it was comic books. Um, and and um, the, the, this was like the 70s Marvel. So it was, it was Marv Wolfman and Len Wein writing with the Amazing Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four and Roy Thomas writing Conan the Barbarian. And Co that was the one exception was, was um, the um, Elsberg de Camp and Lynn Carter had taken all of Robert E. Howard's Conan stories and all of his notes for stories that he would have written about Conan and produced this 12, 12 volume series of Conan books. Um, and they were always like Conan, Conan the Avenger, Conan the Destroyer, Conan the, you know, the unemployed. And uh, <laughs> Conan the Conqueror. That was Conan the King, favorite. too, finally. Right, yeah. And, and, um, and so that was actually, uh, forgive me, Sister Anne. That was how I got through fifth grade math class. Was I? I literally was the kid sitting with the with the math book open, and I can still remember reading um, Howard's story, "Rogues in the House," um, and and it was like a, and this electrifying story where Conan is fighting the man ape Thack, um, and it's really it's you know and 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 uh, and in the meantime, Sister Anne's trying to teach us whatever she was trying to teach us, and I was. Yeah, I cannot believe I got away with that, to, to be honest. <laughs> but when I went to high school, though, um, I went to Catholic high school. So they were like, art program, what? Um, you can do mechanical drawing if you want when you're a senior. And at the same time, I discovered Stephen King. Um, I, I read Christine. And um, that was it. That was like this conversion experience for me. And... Um, and like Paul, I used Dance Macabre in a lot of ways as a reading guide, you know, and, and that was how I found Peter Straub. 
Um, and I, I have vivid memories. Um, and, and that was also the time I, I should just add that Ted Klein's book, Dark Gods, uh, came out. Oh, and God, um, great, great book. Oh, it's, it's, you know, I can remember going to the library and my library had copies of Ghost Story, Shadowland and Dark Gods. And Ghost Story and Shadowland in particular, those were books, you know, and I've, I've said this many times about them, but I, I, um, I will just say it again, that, you know, they were the kind of books that you finished and you were like, man, I did not get most of that, but but it wasn't, you know, sometimes you, you, you read that happens and you feel kind of angry, you know, but in this case, it just felt like, oh, that's so cool. I'm going to be able to go back to that and read it again and again and again and again. And I would just check these books out on a regular basis. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I had written some, I'd written a story when I was in grade school, when I was in fifth or sixth grade. Um, funny that year, um, we had to write a Halloween story. And I, I wrote this story about a guy uh, encountering a Nazgul basically in the, in the bar. It was, it was when uh, uh, Bakshi's Lord of the Rings movie was out. And so I wrote this story about this guy who goes out to the barn and behind his house, it's a thunderstorm and there's a Nazgul there, you know, as, as there is in this neck of the woods. And um, what I can remember quite vividly is reading that story to my classmates and everybody got really quiet. And, you know, that sometimes that happens when you're reading and you're doing a reading and you can feel that you've got the room, you've got the audience, they're right there. And all these kids who were not exactly my biggest fans were like, hey, what's the nerdy guy doing? Um, and, uh, and yeah, they just afterwards, they, they kind of didn't know how to look at me. You know, they, they were like, oh, man, but he just, you know, what? what ah. um, so, yeah, that, that in a way, I, I guess prepared me then for when I read Stephen King and, and was like, oh, I have to do this. That had to be a great feeling when that happened. Yeah, I was like, revenge, suckers! No, no, I was I, I was actually kind of confused myself, to be quite honest. I didn't I didn't know how to process that either. I still don't. Success is hard to handle. What's your favorite story out of Dark Gods? In Dark Gods? Oh, man. Um, I I still remember Nadelman's God. I remember how how just bowled over I was by Nadelman's God. Um, but you know, then you go back to it and you you reread it and you read like you know Man with the Black Horn and you're just like oh my God or Children of the Kingdom. Um, yeah, it's such an amazing book. And years yeah. later, I read the ceremonies a couple of times and I I, I quite like that. I, uh, that took me a little. That was a little bit trickier to to get into. I I think, but I think that's actually a great novel too. I have read Children of the Kingdom. I don't know how many times. Just, it's a great story. Great guide to raising children. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's interesting. Before we go into Laird, that you and Paul, you know, Stephen King got you started in a way. So absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay. What about you, Laird? What? Why did you become a writer? When did that first begin in your mind? Your desire for that. Before I get to that, uh, Petey. That's my oh, idea. yeah. Well, for, for if I had been raised in New York or had lived in a, in New York for the time, especially in the city, um, I think I think Children of the Kingdom probably would have been a no brainer just because it would be nostalgia factor or identification factor because they're all four really brilliant stories. Nadelman's God is a genius story, Black Man with a Horn, but Petey, I, I I don't have it with me right now. I, I don't know whether when I moved over here, whether I lost it or whether it's stashed somewhere. But I used to have uh, that book uh, kind of as a right beside the dictionary and the thesaurus and other reference books because uh, I learned from that story in particular um, how to how to do multi character conversation without and move people around. That's another thing I like about Peter Straub is how he moves characters around. But Klein. It's like a master class in that novella, TD, that that party, and there's 30. I, one time I counted, it's like 32 people are in that room. And of course, one. What, what do you what are you taught? Different length of stories. It's a short story. You can have a couple characters. Novelette. Maybe you could have four or five doing things. In novella, oh, maybe you can have like eight characters and you can have a subplot. I he just is like screw all that. This, here's a story. Here it is. This is just what's happening. You. Know, he treated basically. He he's a movie camera, not not a writer. He he's filming it, and you're seeing what's on the screen, and you're just dealing with it. But I, similar to John, actually, I always wanted to write, and I read similar stuff. Uh, I I wrote my first story uh, 
before I even knew how to write, I just was drawing pictures and I would write gibberish. And I could tell you what the story was about, but it didn't, of course, find any of the symbols. But I wrote my first real story in uh, second grade. And it was, you know, it was a 2,000 word story, something like that. It was one of those deals where the teacher asks for a paragraph, you know, 50 words. And I wrote like a six page graph paper story. <laughs> but uh, and so I wanted to be, I, to be honest, I wanted to be a writer before I really understood anything about reading. I'm sure that I was, you know, I was reading Clifford the Red Dog and, you know, all, all the children's stuff, you know, the formative stuff <clears throat> to get you ready to go to school and all that. But, and of course, people read to me, which I think is a really, I don't, I won't call it a lost art because I don't know what everybody's doing, but I kind of listen to child educators. They, they sort of seem to think it is. I think reading to you, if you want your kids to read or to read and possibly to write, I think reading to them is a big deal at any age. I mean, even with their teenagers, I don't think it, I don't think it matters. I really, I got something out of being read to. Our, back in those days, our teachers read to us quite a bit. Almost every day, we would have 15, 20 minutes of some classic they would be reading, that they would be reading to us, something above our grade level. But uh, when I started reading, which was very young, reading adult fiction, I was probably eight, seven or eight. Uh, I started with um, Edgar Rice Burroughs and Robert E. Howard. Those were the two. My mom had piles and piles of books, and she said, "Well, if you want to look at these, you know, she, you know, she didn't really think I was going to actually read them, but I did, and I, I loved them. And um, also, I got into some more risque stuff, like uh, the Richard Blade, <laughs> the Richard Blade series. Is there anybody out there? That guy in South Texas, you should go look that up. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, and, and that finally, comment, that, that finally, comment's going to come back to haunt me. I know." <laughs> No, but, you know, so, so I do, you know, a lot of my early work was, you know, imitative, you know, I was mimetic stuff based on Edgar Rice Burroughs, Robert E. Howard, um, a little bit of Jack Vance, you know, that kind of thing. And, and of course, we had a lot of, we had a lot of just, you know, Louis L'Amour, you know, other genre type work lying around. And I, I was into Missioner and Harold Robbins, more of a stuff, Harold Robbins. You know, by the time I'm 12, I'm reading all this stuff, Barbara Cartland even. I, you know, we had moved into the wilderness by then, and you know, and then when I ran out of things that I could read or understand or was allowed to read that I couldn't sneak and read anyway, I started writing. And uh, but I, you know, I, I shouldn't say I started, but I mean, I I became kind of like almost pathological about writing. And one thing that I found out though is I I do believe that in my case some of this is I was predisposed. It might be genetic. Uh, my grandfather was a failed. I don't say that to be to be mean. He failed in the sense he you know he quit trying at some point. So he was a failed uh, novelist, and he was in uh, contact with and I can't remember the guy's name. I need to look it up again. But it was a fairly famous uh, last name Garland. I want to say Richard Garland, but I don't think it was Richard Garland. But it was a fairly famous novelist of the day. He wrote you know like sort of men's adventure stuff. And so my grandfather was writing all these sort of semi hard R X rated um, westerns. You know, it was like Louis L'Amour, but with dongs and just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, write, write that down. After, I know that's that's on the back, right? You know, that's we're gonna have way. to use that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, but it was you know the thing is it's it what there there have been Western parodies, obviously, the Edge series, Long Arm, you know, that are quite obviously pornographic parodies or hard R parodies of the Western genre, right? His were absolutely sincere. It was just, you know, uh, very smutty, but he was not trying to, he, this was the thing, this is the way it happened. This is the stuff that happened. But after he died, um, my, my father and his siblings inherited the property and vandals had gone through the property and destroyed it. And so we were cleaning up the place and all of his manuscripts, there were boxes of letters and novels and short stories because you know, it was everything was typed, you know, and it was uh, just cartons of, of things that were scattered everywhere. And I remember sitting there, you know, reading through this going, even back then, you know, I, I was 22 when this happened. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty awful. And the, the letters that he got from this famous novelist were, were pretty fascinating because the guy, was very was very patient. He goes, well, yes, you know, I'm not sure that dongs can be in, <laughs> in this representation of the old west. That might you might be in the wrong genre, my friend. You know, William Burroughs. Maybe you should be writing to him. See what he thinks. But uh, 
it was it was fascinating. But you know, looking back, it really because I had no idea about this. I was writing before I knew about this, and then my dad started talking about it. It was kind of I don't want to say it was a dirty secret of that part of the family, but I think because he had quit and felt kind of embittered, uh, nobody ever wanted to talk about it. And um, so when I started writing, there was a lot of I never understood why my parents were so kind of conflicted about me writing. On one hand, they were like very proud. On the other hand, they did everything they could to stop me. Like literally, I mean, down to beatings. And uh, I think that part of it was, oh my God, here we, here we go again. And they were kind of right. It's just that I made it, I actually got paid to do it. <laughs> uh, you know, this may not work. If, if it doesn't, we'll uh, say it was Kelly Young's idea. If it does work, <laughs> It's the credit goes to me, but you know, it occurs to me that obviously you three know each other a lot better than I know you three. And I thought it might be kind of cool to have you interview each other. For example, John, if you, what, what kind of questions would you like to ask Laird and Paul that I don't know to ask? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, I, I think in, in both, you know, it's funny, right? Because they, they both, Man, you know, like like Paul is so well read, say in in contemporary fiction, I, and not just not just weird or horror fiction, but I mean, people like Murakami and and um, you know, he's always like, oh yeah, I read this, I read that, you know, and and um, and that's kind of fascinating to me. That's kind of fascinating, you know, like like when when I'm talking to him. Um, and, I, and even when I'm sort of conceptualizing his work, I guess, I'm coming at it from a certain direction where I'm thinking, you know, oh yeah, we read Stephen King, we read Peter Straub, you know, that sort of stuff, right? Um, and so I'm positioning it that way. And I, I sometimes, yeah, I, I sometimes think, and, and I'm sure, right, you know, I'm sure they say like Paul, and, and the same thing is true with Laird, right? That I know that, that Laird, growing up, read a lot of like Martin Cruz Smith and, and read a lot of uh, Roger Zelazny say, right? Um, and there's a, a way in which I, I think in, in both their cases, like, like maybe there's a completely different way to read their stuff. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, like maybe, and it's not to say like, like a, a right way, but just that I'm reading it from this angle. And I think that there's this whole other angle maybe that they may think of their stuff in, in relation to, uh, or, or, or so, so that Laird may think, oh yeah, well, this is me doing my Zelazny thing. Um, and and Paul may think this is me doing you know Murakami or or someone else uh, Bolaño for uh, I, I know he's he's also read and and so like I think about that I, I think about saying uh, I think about asking you know like how do you see your work in in other ways like what are the ways like like it must be kind of frustrating right where you're like yeah 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 Stephen King Peter Straub love you great great but what about this you know like like the last few years right I I think with all the the weird stuff that all has, has been attached to Lovecraft, right? And so like everything you do, every time you have like something mildly, like like sublime in your work, everybody's like, oh, it's Lovecraft. And you're like, yes, but maybe not, you know, maybe there's other things going on. So I, I think I think if I were gonna bat a question to, to both of them, um, it, it would have something to do with that. Like, like how would you like to see or what, what are ways that people aren't talking about your work that you wish they, they were, if that makes sense. Yeah. God, longest question ever. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that was the hand grenade. I held it up and I smacked it across the net. There you go. Uh, Laird can answer first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the answer, gonna, is, the answer is 42. Next I week. ain't got nothing. Um, geez, I, I can honestly say, I, I don't know. It's hard. Like, I don't, I don't think about like how I hope people read it until after it's done. Like when I'm in it, I'm so really just sort of focused on that puzzle, but like in my own, like, I want it, I want, I want to be able to read it for myself to get what I want to get out of it. You know, sometimes I don't know what that is. Um, but, and that's what I sort of search for. So I can honestly say I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't think about it until after it's done. And then maybe when after it's done, like, how do I want this to be read? And even then, I, I'm still not sure. I mean, honestly, part of it, because this was going to maybe build into a question I had for both of those guys, like, you know, one of the things I'm definitely very self-conscious of, and maybe Laird has some of this too, because neither him nor I have a degree in English or writing. Um, you know, and I feel like that 
that both helps me and it also makes me more like self-conscious and have a lot more self-doubt. I mean, it's like a push or pull. I'm like pretty, I'm proud not to say that I've done it all myself because I've clearly had help from a lot of people, but you know, I kind of like the idea that I didn't come through like an MFA mill or wasn't told like, Hey, this is how you have to write. I mean, it came from friends, you know, these two guys, you know, they're writers that I admire, but also just from reading a lot of books, that's where it came from. But at the same time, like I get self-conscious about it because I feel like I don't have, the critical language with which maybe to describe something the way John does. So like with Laird, I was going to ask him like, not that I'm ducking the question a little bit here, but I was going to ask him like, if he feels similarly different about, you know, not having the sort of the academic writing background. And I was going to ask John because John is one of the smartest guys, you know, that I know. Um, That's because he doesn't really know many people. Second to Jack Haringa. <laughs> what? Haringa? <laughs> that is unacceptable. <laughs> Right now, there's. Oh. Well, but I'm not smart. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's also the, uh, the heavy heavy question. I'm gonna go get my second beer. Um, oh, question again. <laughs> now, so like with Laird, I was gonna ask him to talk a little bit about like how you know he deals with that part of it. And I was gonna ask John because he obviously has this wealth of you know academic, not only training but you know language and skill set. I'm like curious, like how he turns on and off that sort of part of it. Cause I could, you know, I could feel like that could be almost like stifling at times, but just to have sort of the weight of all this academic stuff that you've learned. Not that I'm against learning stuff. Is that, you that's, are, you yeah, are. Yeah, Philistine. 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 All that useless information. That <laughs> yeah, brain. that's what I'm really trying to say. <laughs> second smartest guy. That's right, wow, <laughs> second smartest guy. T tied for second. Tied for second, even better, that's great. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Uh, Jesus. Take your pick, Laird. You got like two sets of questions now. I, okay. <laughs> you know, it. I used to worry about it. Over time, that anxiety has absolutely dissipated. Not because it isn't a worthy thing to worry about. I, I remember one time my brother was saying, "You know, look how well you're doing, and you didn't, you know, go get a degree in English." And I said, "You know what?" And I didn't because we didn't have any money. You know, Providence didn't really make it very possible. I was lucky to even be alive today uh, that I made it this far. Just even even if, if I didn't write a word, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to be here based on my early years. So, and I did, I did actually, I took a little bit of uh, community college and I really enjoyed the, the academic environment. I, I, it's something that I could see uh, that was actual, a possible, that was a, that was a distinct possibility back uh, when I first started selling stories uh, that I might just go get an AA and then go to, you know, uh, go to a four-year college and, and maybe be a writing instructor or something like that, you know, an English teacher or something along those lines. And then I started, uh, my ex-wife actually went into the, uh, you know, MA program or she went to go get, she went to go get a, a master in teaching and I started selling stories more regularly. And, and not only were, was I selling them, but they were doing, you know, they, I was getting some note and I had people going, hey, write a novel, you know, people from publishers saying, write a novel, we're interested. And so I pursued it. Um, but early on, you know, uh, I remember talking to Gordon Van Gelder and he said, you haven't had any, you know, you haven't been workshop essentially. And I said, no, and he goes, you're really lucky, <laughs> essentially. Uh, he wasn't really, he wasn't really putting down workshopping because he's taught workshops, it was more along the, you know, so I don't want to, you know, throw that, throw him under the bus in that way. What I'm getting at is he was like, not a workshop isn't for everybody. Not everybody needs one. And, and the work, not only that, but it, not every skill set can be uh, sharpened by going to a workshop. He said, in your case, you would have been slaughtered. Uh, in the, in, uh, like Shiva, the story I sold to him, Shiva, open your eye, um, would have been crucified because of the way that most workshops are run. As a matter of fact, years later, uh, after the Emigo sequence had been out, up for a World Fantasy Award, it done, you know, it had succeeded critically and commercially for me. Uh, I think it was Charles Coleman Finley, somebody teaching one of those Clarion pet shops, showed his class, and what, you know, and that's a much more straightforward story than some of these more outre stories that I do, like Shiva. And it was 50 50. Half the class, roughly half the class really liked it, and about half the class absolutely hated it. This is what's wrong with it. And so, I don't, you know, I was able to very innocently develop my skills and my talents uh, without being steeped in 
an atmosphere where no, this is how a lot of no. And that's, that's I think that's one of the things that that's a downfall of workshopping, whether it's professional workshopping, you know, like I don't want to pick on carry on, but it could be any of them or even in a college setting. There's a whole lot of peer review, but people aren't necessarily your peers. They're not necessarily qualified to help you. And there's a lot of overcooking. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, sort of strictures that are considered how you do it. And there's a lot of the word no uh, that I think people fall into. You know, when you go, I was in um, high school working with uh, special needs kids for a while. One of the things that they kept talking about was don't say no to provide alternatives. And you know, the stories that I hear are coming out of a lot of workshops, no, not one in particular, but just a lot of workshops is, there's a whole lot of no, you can't do this, or this didn't work for me, which is, yeah, that's kind of what you're paying for, but it also, um, it depends on who it's coming from and with the expertise that it's delivered. And I think I was very lucky to, to, to not be sort of tramped down in that way. For me, the no became, was more, well, this story won't sell. I won't buy this story. The, the people telling me no were the people who actually, uh, or, or, or then later on when I started selling stories, uh, readers, you know, you would get feedback. Uh, individual data points of yes or no, good or bad, aren't, aren't as important as what's happening overall uh, with, with, your, with your writing life, with your professional writing life. Uh, and, and so as time went by, I, I just sort of, I sort of got rid of a couple things. One was um, the anxiety about not having a degree in English. And the second was, you know, the, the anxiety of influence. Uh, I, I very much subscribe to the, um, the ecstasy of influence. And so I compete against myself, not against, uh, you know, what, say, John's, what John's doing with his, with his particular set of skills. You know, he brings something different to the table. I really do think that depending on what your background is, it really does flavor your your fiction and or, or your creative nonfiction. I think it's all very valuable. Um, I would feel extremely apprehensive because I've written a lot of essays. I would feel extremely app apprehensive if I had to go compete with like say Gary Wolf or somebody like that in an academic setting where we're gonna footnote this 45 page you know thesis on on Roger Zelazny or something. So it wasn't like an argument. You know, it wasn't like a, pers a persuasive essay or an informal essay. It's something that uh, requires a lot of, as as Paul was saying, a lot of argot or nomenclature, and everything's very specific, done in a specific way. But I don't. That's not what I do. My, my job is, as an entertainer is to, is to create immersive narratives, and whether that's fiction or nonfiction. And I find that my background has equipped me. To do it well enough to make a living at it. You were talking about the anxiety of influence uh, just a minute ago, and uh, in an interview with Electric Lit, I think it was an email interview, it's, it looks like, uh, you write, the first rule of Author Club, once you collect your paycheck and that story is out, is out in the world, it isn't yours anymore. It belongs to everyone. It's a question of perspective. Uh, the hell of it is, is this, far better authors than Laird Barron diligently toil with less notice than they deserve, so let's count our blessings. You want to compare me positively to one of the most famous authors in the English language? I'm not going to spit in your eye because I was hoping you'd align me with some other literary heavyweight. Uh, I don't suffer from the anxiety of influence. It's too much work. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, that kind of spoke to me but uh the, i you do see that with with some authors oh right and you know what that's everybody has to walk the path right i mean that yeah. sounds corny but it's we're all hurtling toward our doom and uh we all uh you know you have to basically it's up to you to which which way you're gonna you know how you're gonna get there and so I, it's not for me to judge how somebody else does it you know, and, and to touch on one last thing, you know, do I wish that people would read me in a certain way? Well, of course, you always want to be read, you understood, right? But one of the things that I've tried to do, and I'm, it's, it's funny because I'm even doing it more so in some ways with the, with the commercial, with the commercial writing, because there's less, there's less room for digression. There's less room for me to seed it with things. 
it's not it's not a formula, but it's certainly there's a there's a um, a template or a blueprint of the tradition that I'm working in. Oh, and you can you can add things and you can subtract things and you can move things around and do things in unexpected ways. There's always some way to shave a little bit off that race car type of thing, but you still are working within rules. But I found that um, it's become even more important for, for me to write on two or more levels, or I think my friend Philip Fertossi said something about track writing. In other words, you're, 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 you have two or more tracks going in a, in a screen, but there's the, there's the surface. Somebody like Reffin, you know, with his uh, Duel to Die Young would be an obvious, or, or uh, Only God Forgives, where you have the noir on the surface, and it's got Hitman and gangsters and femmes fatale and all that stuff, and, you know, money's at the root of everything, and everything's bad. But then there's gods and nature and uh, other concerns, more you know, less specific and maybe even broader concerns that are kind of sort of roiling beneath the surface there. And of course, then there's the things that you see, you know, he gets to use color because he's a filmmaker. So he's using color and sound and textures like that to get you to, and using the camera to draw you to certain things. So that some people are seeing, one kind of viewer is seeing one thing and impatiently waiting for the next fix. Another kind of viewer is seeing the other thing. And a third kind of viewer is seeing all of it. And I try to write that way. Not to say that it's particularly, like I'm trying to write something deep in the sense of, oh, it's profound, but more like, no, there's, there's a surface element that will snag the broadest amount of readers. I even do this in short fiction. As many readers as I can get. Look, there's a guy looking for something and people want to stop him. We can all get behind that. And there's something at stake. The child's life is in the balance or the farm, you know, or, you know, whatever. But then there's another level and there's like, you know, there's the angst or there's, or there's these other things that you can bring in that are not so obvious. And obviously you have the Easter eggs. And so, I've always written for more than one type of audience. Uh, and so the only frustration I ever get is not when somebody reads it a certain way, but when someone doesn't really read it carefully and then makes criticism. Like, we, we, none of us are, are or should be immune to criticism, but we all deserve a fair read if you're gonna, if you're gonna slag. And so, yeah, as a peeve, it's not a big deal. I, I take it and I move on. But when someone who obviously has not really and I'm not talking about getting the deeper nuances, but like when someone just really obviously hasn't read one of my short stories because they went zooming through thinking that it's a very linear three act structure and then complains because they didn't get something. I, I do have to admit in those cases, I'm kind of like, that's on you. You know, you should have read, you should have read more carefully. Uh, you know, there's a recent TV uh, series. I think it went off the air a couple of, a couple of years ago. It was ran for five or six seasons. It was called person of interest and, talking just now Laird you reminded me of it where this this first level was basically these two guys who are trying to stop uh, crimes or murders or whatnot before they happen in New York City and you know so many people can get behind that right but then the series sort of sneaks you into that this isn't really about that it's about artificial intelligence you know and it was really really neat the way that they did that you know, suddenly somebody that would never watch a show about that was watching Person of Interest and was getting into that. So, um, yeah. Well, in, in my, you know, my colleagues here do in different, radically different ways from each other and from me, they do that as well. That's one of the reasons I think they're uh, skilled writers and I, I'm always, because I'm always challenged. Paul always has something beneath the surface. John always has, uh, he's a deconstructionist, a, a, you know, he's sort of almost like a Metacritic going through, going through stuff and he's, 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 he's disassembling, you know, there's a, like a lot of postmodernism to some of Paul's, especially short fiction, where he's critiquing, it's like, it's like there, there's a critique going on here, but you don't always, you think you, some people I think, think they know what it is, but it may, that may not be the thrust of it. And John actually takes, uh, it's sometimes playfully, sometimes you know, with, with, with acid, uh, is deconstructing. So yet, so both of them will give you, like, it, you know, if you took a, a representative piece, you took a piece that had, you know, a sample, you know, a, a plot in it, they're going to give you that plot, they're going to give you the three-act structure or a five-act structure, but there's going to be some kind of, and, and not necessarily hidden, there's just going to be other parts that are, that are moving in. And I think a lot of writers, 
it's not so much that a lot of writers don't do this. That's not the thrust of this at all. It's just that these these two that are sitting here with me, this is what this is what they do, and it's you know uh, I, I think that for per, personally for me, it's always a challenge uh, to to get everything the first time, and I usually can't. You need to go back, no matter how carefully you read, uh, because it because there are different perspectives in, in the writing. You almost it's almost like sometimes when we write. Uh, you can sit some or read. You can see the ghosts within the author that are competing to be to be heard. Some, I mean, I've noticed that in my own writing. Sometimes it's you know the, the my voice will creep in or my concerns will creep in, and that's very obvious. But other times I'll look at it and go, I don't I almost don't recognize that. And I realize that was me from years ago. That was some little, little part of me that's resurfaced from the from the primordial muck of the subconscious and is saying, hey. This is something I still care about, just not consciously. And you see that, if you, if you, especially if you know people, you get to know them. And if, if they write a lot, that's how, how you can get to know them if you aren't personal friends with them, is you will see these ghosts in their work, and they're talking to each other. And there's this almost like a sub-narrative going on um, with, with that kind of a writer. And I, it rewards reading not only again, but maybe even over time, like years later, and I think music's this way too. You get something new out of it, not because you were missing something, which is quite possible, but because it was it was a piece of a code that was meaningless to you at that point in your life. You didn't identify with it, and sometime down the road, you will, uh, or you might. And I think that that's pretty powerful stuff. That's why I re that's why I reread my favorite authors over and over again. I will never stop rereading Zelazny or Straub or or T. D. Klein. Yeah, what's that saying? Uh, no man walks through the same river twice because the river is not the same and he's not the same man. Something like that. Um, so, Laird, same deal. If you if you feel like it, what if you were the guy doing the interview? What what questions would you like to lob at these two guys? Oh, the same question for both for both of them. Um, how? like a two-part question how has your view of writing changed in the last 10 years but not even 10 years since you become became more comfortable you became sort of established you know whether you're well known or not that's beside the point but let's say over the last eight to ten years how ha has your perspective on writing any aspect of it but preferably the business end of it the professional end of it how has that changed and do you and do you think it's had any effect on you Paul, like, you a start like a fundamental change, you know, influence on you, how you think, how how, how you behave. Let's have John go first. He doesn't answer. No, me. no, no. This is Paul. <laughs> Paul was, was going to say something. He was totally going to oh, say no, something. I was scratching my arm. Yeah, yeah. Sure, you were. You, you don't have to raise your hand. It's it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, John, then. Like I mean, this is more. I guess the professional side of things. But something I, I find myself thinking about more because um, I feel it's almost we're at this point in time, obviously, with. Well, let me start over. So readers have never had as much access to writers, the, you know, the writers that they're reading as they do in this point in time. Right. And sort of on the flip side of things, you know, us writers working now, there are no writers in the, hist you know, the history of the world that have had to deal with as much uh, feedback or contact. I guess, I mean, you could try to hide from it, but even if you, I mean, short of like not being on the internet at all, it's impossible to hide from it. Um, so there's that, I don't know, I've been thinking about that weird push and pull, like there's never been as much contact. You know, some of it's great, you know, you meet a lot of, you know, great, obviously to me, the favorite part is meeting other writers that I enjoy and meeting, you know, really enthusiastic readers too. But it's, I've, I've been finding myself thinking about it more and more, like how does that affect my work? You know, and just even obviously I know you know, being on social media too much, you know, rewires your brain. And that's a fear that I have that my writing is suffering. Not that I look back at other things that I've written and think that's genius because <laughs> it's not like, you know, I still, I read stuff that I wrote a while ago and I still cringe and like, ah, I wish I could go back and fix things like that. But in terms of the professional side of it, it's weird. I think is unavoidable. I mean, there's obviously there's, um, you know, never say never. There's always exceptions in every case, but, to you know, to have some level of you know financial or sales success, 
like you, you kind of have to be online and you have to be available. Um, but at the same time, it's almost like, you know, the observation changes the event, right? You know, that sort of, that's that whatever scientific. The observer effect. Yeah, yeah, the observer effect. I mean, how does that affect the writers? I mean, obviously, I think the most most blatant cases are when, like, you know, giant fan bases react about something, like, within a franchise that they love and demand that it be changed, with that, which I just find actually really horrifying. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, publishing is changing so quickly, it's hard to anticipate. But, I mean, those you know, things that I've talked about to me are truths that we have to deal with, that you have to be out there if you want either success or continued success because New York City publishers honestly have no idea how to, and I'm not saying this like I have the answer, but they no longer know how to have a career that sustains. Like I was talking to my agent about this fairly recently. And he said like a lot of the older crime writers, you know, that still pop up on the bestsellers list maybe for like a week or two, but that's it. And like, and he said this, the discussions within publishing circles is our, no one, like, and this is only like a 20 year old like phenomenon. Like, they were able to build like these bestsellers for, you know, 20 years ago. But now like someone like uh, will come out with a debut novel and it's a bestseller, but then the next novel it's like, eh. And for some reason you know, they can't, they don't know why those readers aren't following that one. I mean, besides that there's just so much choice. And it seems to me, you know, looking at the ones who are successful that do have a fan base, they're the ones that have like an online persona. Um, and it's weird because I, I do worry, like how does that change the work? How, how does that change your expectations as a writer? You know, I do the best I can to shut it out, um, but it's impossible not to have to hear that little buzz. You know, yeah, I don't know only, if I answered the question, but that's. <laughs> I was just going to jump in and say that the only writers who can afford to do that are writers who've already made it for a, a long period of time. I was watching an interview recently with Dean Koontz. He's really gone off the. <laughs> he used to write horror novels. I'm not sure what he's writing now, but. Westerns with dogs, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, th I think Christian fiction, basically. But, uh, you know, they showed his writing room, and he's hunting and pecking on a 20-year-old computer. And he never gets on the Internet. And if he, there's an email he has to see, they print it out and give it to him. You know, and then he writes it and, they, and gives it back to them. He basically just, he's really sealed off. Not many writers can do that. He's like the sixth highest paid writer in the world. Yeah, not new ones. Yeah. So, yeah, he can afford to do that. Most writers can't. So, John, you want to? No. no. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway. No, because I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking about, about Paul's question and about Laird's question and, and thinking that they're for me, they, there's some way in which they're kind of related to one another, the, the sort of question about, yeah, I have like a lot of academic training, um, even though I'm, I'm ABD, right? And probably, you know, all the dissertation and probably will be until I, I die. Um, and part of the reason that I'm ABD is, is because I had started really writing fiction in the way that I had always wanted to. I'd kind of lucked into publication um, in part because of my PhD program where I wrote a story that became on Skua Island, um, and uh, which my wife said, you know, I, I was like, you know, send this, send send this out. I, I was like, I want to submit this. She was like, send this to to fantasy and science fiction. Send this to the top market, and you know, I got in and and so on. And 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 the minute the minute that I did that, the minute that I got that publication, man, I won't say I was ready to chuck academia, but I, I wanted to do it a lot more. You know, I, it was definitely like, oh my god, you know this this dream that I've had is, is gonna, is, is really gonna come true because I had been writing stuff in, in my twenties, say, um, in my earlier twenties, you know, more kind of, I guess, literary fiction, um, of, of, of a, a kind, although I think there was always a lot of, it, it always was about anxiety. It was always sort of horror fiction of a, of a kind. And I had gotten what I now recognize were some really lovely rejection letters, really encouraging rejection letters. But, um, it's only when I look at them now and I see that they're saying, oh, please send us more stuff. And I think, oh, you idiot. You know, like if a student brought you this today, you would say, hey, that's really good. But at the time, you know, so um, what's weird is, is that, you know, yeah, a, a lot of my training was in academia and I had a teacher, a professor when I was an undergrad 
who told me, she said, you're going to be a great writer someday. And I, I said, oh, why? I mean, what, what kid doesn't want to hear that? Um, but she said, because you're reading, you're reading the classics. And, and that really, um, that really stuck with me, this idea that, that I, I, and I, I like to read, you know, I've always liked to read and, and, and I, I like, um, it's like what I was talking about with Straub stuff. You know, I love this stuff that you could go back to, that you could read and reread and, and read again and, and not exhaust, you know, just this kind of inexhaustible quality that, that was always a big part of, of who I was. But I think for me, what, what started to happen, and this is where I guess the questions both kind of tie together to me is, is that the further I went with my fiction, the less kind of comfortable, I guess I was in academia. Um, and, and part of that was because, you know, my colleagues would say to me, Oh, you published something, you know, what, what did you write? And, um, and sometimes I would be sort of confrontational, you know, and say a horror story. And you would see the sort of shutters go down behind their eyes and they'd be like, Oh, how nice, you know, um, I might as well have said pornography, you know? Um, and, um, and gradually I, I, I accommodated a bit, you know, I said, oh, ghost stories or Stephen King kind of stuff. You know, I would try to find ways to, to talk about this, to frame what I did in a way that didn't alienate my colleagues too much. But, um, you know, and I was, I was still doing, and I, I still do some critical, critical work. It's more reviewing now. At the time it was more writing critical articles about, you know, people like Lovecraft and Fritz Leiber and that. And, um, but I, I think um, I was I was kind of moving further and, and further away. Some of that, I guess, was resentment on my part, if I'm being honest about it, because by the time I left uh, my job, my adjunct position at SUNY New Paltz, frankly, I had more publications than anybody in the department, except the guy who'd been teaching there for 50 years. And I was still an adjunct. Um, and um, and so there was a part of me that, that, that it was, a, you know, sort of like, um, you won't have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore, you know. <laughs> um, but it was it was also feeling that um, that yeah, I, I was already kind of out of a lot of that that life, you know. That that the I I I think it's wonderful if you want to get an MFA. I think um, if it if it helps you, that's terrific. Um, anything that helps you write, right? But I also think that it introduces you to a different kind of culture, a different set of of expectations for your writing and for your publishing and and what have you. And I had kind of moved away from that. It's it's obviously still like part of my DNA as a writer and as a as a person. Obviously, I love to hear myself talk, right? But it um, I I think that that at this point, you know, I, I was at a faculty event with uh, uh, with my wife who, who, who teaches at New Paltz, and I was at a faculty event with her um, a, a couple of months ago. And I, you know, it's been about a year since I taught at New Paltz. As I said, I've been at this high school instead because it's, you know, money, right, to, to keep body and soul together. And, um, and I suddenly thought, wow, you know, I, I felt like I'm the writer hanging out with a bunch of professors. I, I don't feel like the sort of quasi professor, maybe I'm a writer, you know, so I, I feel in a lot of ways much more um, uh, at peace or something like that with 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 my role just as writer and um, which is which is nice and and yeah the the stuff that I write is what it is you know kind of academically inflected or something like that. Um, Brian Evanson once paid me that what I think is a sort of dubious uh, compliment of saying, oh, yeah, he writes like sort of fake academic prose really well. You know? <laughs> OK, <laughs> but I kind of I took I took what he was uh, in the context. It, it was actually a compliment. Um, but yeah, it's it's but I agree with Paul too, the and, and Laird that like um, publishing is in this really weird place right now. And, and I think when the three of us, you know, when, when we hang out with each other, when we talk on the phone, it, it comes up inevitably, you know, what's going on. Um, and, um, man, none of us know, <laughs> it's like, like, you know, we're, we're doing our best as, as writers. I think that, um, the presence for horror writers, say, and writers of the of the fantastic in general, the presence of the small press, I think, or independent publishing, whatever they want to call themselves, I think that that makes a difference than, um, say, twenty or thirty years ago. I think you have a much more robust small press in a lot of ways, but I don't I don't know what the full parameters are of that. You know, it's it's the 
the um, it really is like the fable of the blind men and the elephant, you know, that we're all trying to to figure out what this uh, what this thing is, and and um, and yeah, like uh, uh, like Paul, um, I, I would absolutely like to be doing this full time and, and supporting myself full time doing this. Um, but what's the number? I think it's like three hundred writers in the United States are able to support themselves with their writing, and that's out of how many thousands or tens of thousands or whatever people who are publishing stuff. Um, I, you know, I, I maybe I may have the wrong uh, the wrong statistic, um, but but the, the I think the 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 overall I don't know uh, the 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 thrust of the of of the point is is valid that it's really hard to support yourself just and your family through your writing. Uh, Whatever it is, it's a really low percentage. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, guys, what what books are what books are you reading right now? I hate reading. <laughs> uh, I'm reading. I'm reading several things. I'm reading some manuscripts. I just read. Um, a manuscript by uh, Paul for uh, or Phil for Paul, Phil for Cossie. Um, I can't go into it, you know, it's with his agent and all that, but it's fabulous, like a black, like a sort of like a blockbuster, I think. One thing I like about Phil, I think the fans out there should check him out. Is he he writes he writes on the spectrum as well, and he's he's a Hollywood guy, and he does scouting in Hollywood. And uh, in fact, I believe that he worked on that. The new weapon series. He's he's always involved in these cool things, but he writes very. Uh, he he can write basically all along the spectrum, like pure adventure, free act structure, very commercial. And he also writes very weird. If he wants, to, he can write this really weird baroque, elliptical, postmodern, you know, whatever kind of thing. And he has written uh, a very commercial, although very uh, very well written. There's some depth to it. Um, manuscript that I think could be, a, could be a big deal. I, I don't know, but I think it could be a big deal. Uh, and of course, I'm reading a couple other manuscripts for people. I, I've been getting a few things lately, you know, people wanting to look at it for blurbs and whatnot. Uh, Speaking of Phil, just let me jump in real quick. Everybody listening should go by Behold the Void and Shiloh right now because yep. the publisher is great. Phil, yeah, I don't know. Uh, no, <laughs> he's, a, he's, a really, he's a really great writer and he's a good friend. He's just a good guy. Well, and you'll see a, you'll see the range in Behold the Void, um, yeah, multiple, and that's not even the whole range. But the, the point is, is he's a really good writer, and I'm pretty excited about this manuscript that I saw. And I'm reading some other things that are also very good. Uh, for pleasure, I'm reading because it has a bearing on my my Coleridge Coleridge series, and just so that Putnam, you know, does it go why? Uh, my current novel is Black Mountain. And I was actually reading this author because of some of the some of the items that are, or some of the elements in Black Mountain and the, the follow up that I'm writing now, and that's James Dickey. Uh, I, I read his novels in the past, but I, I like read a little bit. I dipped into his poetry, but right now, uh, so I was familiar with it. But right now, I am very thoroughly, carefully, meticulously reading uh, the collected poems which came out in i want to say 2002 or 2003 i'll definitely go back and get because he has 15 volumes of poetry so i need to go back and, and get the b-sides uh, because the person introducing it's like well these are the best you know i'm like okay but i want to see the other ones but he has a particular he had a particular uh philosophy and about nature and the thing is is he rubs me as a, as a human being he rubs me the wrong way and a lot of his poetry rubs me the wrong way but I find that really fascinating and really valuable. And the stuff that works for me, the stuff that speaks to me is his, is his more naturalistic, you know, the natural world. Uh, yeah, you know, I think he probably was a, either a fan or a, or, or a, a foe of, of Jeffers because there's, they do align in some ways. He just comes at it with a much more Baptist style. There, there's definitely this, this religious, you know, I haven't read up on his life that much, but I know that he's really, you know, was religious. And so, um, that is part of it, but he's just, I, I found myself saying he's one of the very, he, he is a writer that I'm envious of because it's like watching somebody, you know, you're, you're big and you're strong, you know, and you above average, you can lift weights and you stand next to somebody who's bigger, stronger, and lifts heavier weights. And there's no amount of practice that's going to get you there. You, you might get bigger and stronger, but you might not ever be there because it's just physics. 
and I'm reading and I'm thinking about the physics of Dickie's poetry and saying to myself, yeah, you know, never, <laughs> never be, you know, I'll never be satisfied with where I am because this exists, but it's really helping me with this because this third, this third novel in the series, um, Worse Angels, really delves even deeper into the, the natural world of the Catskills and the Adirondacks and Western and also Western uh, New York State. I'm really, I've really fallen in love with New York State. And of course, Dickie's poetry is not about any of that, really. But just the idea of the natural world and the darkness inherent within that, because we, we all we have this romanticized notion that Burroughs should have, you know, Burroughs should have disabused us some years, decades ago. The evil was already here waiting, a different kind of evil, a different kind of darkness. And Dickie definitely seems to have embraced that philosophy. And I can't say I'm. I would probably be we'd be marching along holding hands. You know? uh, so, so that's what I'm. That's what I'm on right now. Paul, what are you reading right now? Uh, so I've been out of school for a couple of weeks, so I've, I'll have i name a, a bunch of things I've tried to catch up on. Uh, like Blair and I got to read a, you know, a manuscript that's just making the rounds now. It's a novel by Sarah Langan, uh, which I'm really excited about. You know, Hopefully, you know, I'm sure it'll be sold and published by somebody, and hopefully it's soon. Um, I also read Alan Baxter, Australian writer, his short story collection, which is quite good. I'll the title is escaping me because uh, I'm terrible at remembering titles. Uh, and actually, what is Sarah's title? Oh man, yeah, I'm not gonna remember her title either. Sorry, sorry. They're both awesome, Paul. They're both awesome. <laughs> they are both awesome, and it, you know, it's a PDF, so that's another reason why I don't remember the title. <laughs> uh, actual books, though, I, I recently just this week finished uh, Karen Russell's Orange World, uh, you know, which is excellent. You know, it's uh, you know, they're all genre stories. You know, and obviously she's you know seen as a high literary writer, which she should be. But yeah, you know, she's also writing genre as well. And there's one story in particular that I thought was just genius. Um, and sort of the conceit is there's an older gentleman who is who just bought at auction like a small tornado because there are these like tornado farmers. Um, you know, and just that weird conceit, and she takes it and goes it forward. It's a really sort of dark story about family and relationships, and and the main character is not a very likable person. Uh, but by the end of it, I mean there's all this family stuff, but it's also to me, I thought the story was about writing. It was about being an artist, and it, it really sort of blew me away with what she did with that. Um, and then I read uh, uh, Clarice Lipsector's The Passion of G.H., which was this, like, wild 200-page novel about the smushing of a cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and all these, like, weird, like, philosophical, mystic, you know, observations. Uh, it really was. Like, I've never read anything like that book before. Um, and just today, uh, I read like the first 50 pages of Richard Cadre's uh, The Grand Dark, which is wonderful. Uh, it very much feels like, uh, you know, he's doing sort of a China Mieville, one of China's like early novels, uh, New Crosbun. I'm probably saying it wrong. You know, those early sort of like wild, dark fantasy, immersive world kind of novels. But uh, Richard's mixes, definitely mixes some like crime noir in as well. And it's it's really, really good. I'm, Looking forward to getting back to it. It's it's great to be a teacher during the summer months. You get to catch up on all that reading. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Obviously, Danielle's off now too, and we keep forgetting which day of the week it is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's Sunday every day. Uh, yeah. John, what about you? Um, well, actually, I just got done with with uh, with Paul's collection, uh, growing things. Um, I don't know, a, a week or two ago, I guess. You don't, um, have, you don't have to be nice. You can. Well, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> let's move on. No, no, it's it, um, do your locust review right now. No way. <laughs> there comes a time in a reviewer's life. <laughs> no, actually, I read. I, I read. Um, I read Black Mountain. Um, not not too much longer ago, and they were. You know, they're they're both these amazing books. I, I mean, Black Mountain. Um, which I probably am going to try to sneak into Locus um, because it is a horror novel. It, it seems to me of a, of a kind it, it's, I don't want to give anything away except to say that it, in an odd sort of way, it, it really reminds me of, of, of uh, both the throat uh, Straub's novel and, and um, possibly even Coco uh, that the, there were things about them that, that um, I, I find yeah. fascinating. And um, I, uh, yeah, growing things, um, there's just stuff in there, man. You know, I, I said that like the first thing of Paul's I read was that um, compositions for the young and old. 
and then you know the next the next story collection I read was was the next story collection, a second story collection. In the meantime, and between those two books, you know, he got so much better that it was like a like almost like vertical, you know, the 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 the, the, the climb, the the, and it's not to say the compositions of the young and old were bad. But it's just it <laughs> wasn't yeah. like that piece. I think it's aliens, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, the, the second book you could read, you know, it was written in English, you know. Yeah, um, the subtitle was "There's no way to go but up." <laughs> 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 and and you know um, and it was such a it was such a steep climb that it was just amazing and and again it's just like you know the, the, with growing things there's just this continuing climb that's that's just really amazing and you know what you're seeing too is he's playing um, with with his own stuff with with these the 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 most recent three novels which which form a kind of thematic trilogy I think that the, this book is is sort of tying them together in interesting, that the stories in here are tying them together in interesting and, and playful kinds of ways. Um, but enough about these two losers. Um, I, uh, you said that um, my first collection sucked, and I was, I've was i been playing with myself, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the two takeaways. Western, <laughs> Westerns with dongs. That's the takeaway from this uh, from this Lovecraft easy. And that should go in like the... What, the what a great title. book title that would be. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but um, no, I'm, 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 I'm in the middle of reading a whole bunch of things. I'm almost at the end of um, John Horner Jacobs' uh, A Lush and Seething oh, Hell. Yeah. Which is his? Um, it's two novellas, um, a short one, a shorter one, um, "The Sea Dreams It's the Sky," which I, I was out first as an, an electronic edition last year, which is just terrific, and then um, a, a longer one. Um, it, it was it was collected with this this longer one, whose name went right out of my head the moment I started talking. But anyway, uh, it's it's an amazing collection. I really can't I, I, I can't speak highly enough. Um, it's it's gripping. It's dark. It's it's beautifully written. It, it, honestly, it's one of those books that makes you go back because you know there's there's so much to read, right? And you see people's names and you think, oh, right, that guy. Yeah, I'll get to that person at some point. It was one of those books that makes you go back and you're like, ah, oh, all right, I at least have to put all this guy's books on my Amazon wish list, you know? Like like I he he moves up in the in the in in a significant way um in the um in in, in the uh, uh, what in the reading ladder or something like that. Um I, I had a chance to read an advanced copy of Carrie Laban's first novel, um, A Hawk in the Woods, which is terrific. Um, a highly, a highly Lovecraftian novel that I, I, I have the impression some reviewers have been a little confused by that because it's, it's in essence a riff on um, the thing on the doorstep. And if you've read the thing on the doorstep and you know that that's a story about people, a family who have the ability to, to transfer their consciousnesses into one another's bodies and maybe have some other psychic powers as well, that when you read this story, which is a sort of contemporary take on, on the descendants of this, or the cousins, I guess it would be, of this family, then you read it and you're like, holy cow, this is amazing. Look at what she's doing. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that um, it's, it's gripping. I, I whipped through it in a couple of days. Um, I've also started reading um, a novel called uh, Memento Mori by Brian Hauser, um, which is um, just a head trip. It's it's um, it's about a, a I guess it belongs to the sort of lost film uh, genre, and it's it's kind of um, more Clark Ashton. Oh no, uh, Robert W. Chambers, The King in Yellow, um, but um, it, it's all that kind of faux documentary stuff and faux academia stuff um, that obviously is close to my heart. Um, so yeah, I, that's. Uh, that's also I haven't finished it, but but highly highly recommended. Um, and um, I started reading Jennifer McMahon's new novel. Um, is it the in, the invited, the un, the invited, or the uninvited? I think it's the invited. Uh, which uh, again, so far so good. I feel like there's man, it's just impossible to keep up with everything, you know. And and um, there's um, I, I believe as a as a reviewer. I believe very much in promoting what I love, you know, and, and the problem is there's so much good stuff, you know, like, like, it's not even a matter of like, like if I, if I don't get to, to review a book and obviously my own writing, my own fiction writing complicates matters, but if I don't get to review a book, that's not necessarily a reflection on the book. It, it's just that there's so much stuff and, and a limited amount of so much good stuff, so much worthy stuff. Um, and just a limited number of hours in the day, you know, 
Um, and um, at nighttime, my nighttime reading, I'm reading Wilkie Collins. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Larry, John just explained to us why we're not getting a Locust review. <laughs> <laughs> this was your Locust review. <laughs> John, I got to ask you, um, I posted a quote from a Stephen Hamilton book. Uh, and you wrote how much you like that series, Winter of the Wolf Moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's really good. He's really yeah. good. He's a local guy. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great series. Um, he, he had a great, I'm going to interrupt you just so I yeah, can no, get no, this right. quote out. Steve Hamilton, some years ago, I had him visit my class, actually when my son was born, when my oh, youngest no son was born. He came to visit my class at New Paltz. And one of, we were talking, and one of the things he said, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but he talked about how he'd loved writing crime stories when he was a kid. And then as an adult, he kind of came back to them. And he, he said, uh, happiness is being able to do something that you loved as a child in a way that satisfies you as an adult. And I thought, man, that is spot on. That is, that is at least in, for me, at least in terms of my writing, that's absolutely right. Uh, yeah, if you're into mysteries, the Alex, the Alex McKnight series by Stephen Hamilton. Yeah, yeah, really good great. stuff. Uh, and if you're into mysteries um, and thrillers, noir, uh, Laird, you've written a whole lot of weird fiction, horror. Um, actually, I've told you this before, but you know, way before I knew you, um, I don't often read something that really unsettles me. And it was one of your early collections. I can't remember which one. And it was even before we moved from Iowa, but... Uh, I was reading one of the stories in the collection and I had to put it aside for like a week before I came back to it because it was so unsettling. You were like, look at the copy editing. This is horrifying. <laughs> yeah, it was very unsettling. All the, all the grammar <laughs> <mistakes>. <laughs> can't, can't they hire an editor? I mean, come on. It was horrifying. Yeah. But uh, you're, you're so great at that. And now you're writing this new series. You want to talk about that for just a second, for those who may not know? Right, okay. Uh, it's the, the Isaiah Coleridge saga. Isaiah Coleridge is uh, mom's from New Zealand, so he's part Maori, dad's uh, Air Force, big old white Air Force officer, and uh, essentially he is estranged from his family fairly early on in his teens, and he ends up uh, being raised by sort of a godfather, literally a godfather figure, uh, and becomes a sort of a freelance enforcer for the mafia. Something goes down, and he is, instead of being killed, he's exiled. You know, don't come back. Don't step, you know, don't come west of the Mississippi or north of Coke, Coke, Coke Junction. And he finds himself in upstate New York recovering uh, from his wounds, and he decides... Uh, He's always kind of wanted to be an investigator. He kind of has this romantic idea of being a, a Chandler, you know, Bogart kind of a figure. And uh, a girl goes missing. And so he decides to use his particular set of skills, as they would say, track her down. And uh, that, a lot of people get hurt in the process. And so uh, that was sort of the, the first book, in a, you know, kind of a race against time to find her uh, in a nutshell. Uh, since then, I uh, published uh, or written and had published Black Mountain, which continues his adventures. And... A lot of people, you know, the first one's very violent, bloody, uh, and I think in a lot of ways it's very much an origin, you know, or a, of course, and there is a sort of the superhero about him or the ancient hero about him. I've, I've kind of modeled him off, off that kind of um, theme rather than, yeah, he's, you know, people are going to reach for Spencer or Jack Reacher or Travis McGee, and I love all that stuff, especially the, especially the older stuff. Continental off, whatever. There's bits of that DNA because it's in me, and I'm, I'm trying to write that kind of a character, and I, I definitely want to tip my hat to that. But he's just as much, if, if, and if the series continues, which I think it will, um, he's just as much or more Beowulf or Achilles or Odysseus or Hercules, partially because of his occasionally almost superhuman abilities uh, physically, but but also for the there's a certain mindset that he, or an aesthetic that he embodies, that's not even, it's not even conscious to him. It's something that the reader might start picking up in the way that life treats him, the universe treats him. So there's, I, I'm having a great time writing it. Um, it's different from my 
from my day to day, you know, my short story uh, stuff. Mostly in the sense that it's trimmed down, it's slimmed down, it's starker, um, it's more accessible, it's less digressive. You know, if, if I were writing uh, a, a series of novels that were, you know, high literary horror novels, I'd have 300 characters in them. You know, I try to keep I try to keep this much more accessible for people who don't enjoy that kind of reading, but also rewarding for my fans. And I'm really pleased, especially with the first one did fine, but the second one, which side slips much closer to the abyss um, of, of horror, and primarily psychological horror and kind of mysticism, you know, not outright occultism, but sort of existentialism, how we, you know, how basically the nature of evil and, and the fact that we, we do have inscrutable mysteries or unsolvable unsolved mysteries uh, around us every day. But without actually going over the edge, the, the, I got, as I would in a, a, a weird tale or an outright horror, a supernatural horror tale. And I'm having, but I'm having a lot of fun because there is enough horror and mystery in the natural world, which I, I think encompasses mankind, that it really is sad. You know, you're talking about the Steve Hamilton quote, you know, it's not so much I'm not in a position where I'm trying to satisfy, my, be satisfied with what I like as a child. I'm more finding that I'm becoming more and more satisfied with what I've been trying to get to in horror all these years. Because I'm, because of the, I won't say handcuffs, but because of the stricture, because of the template that I have to abide by, or I feel like I have to abide by to play fair with crime readers and mystery and thriller readers, that it actually is making me a better writer in some ways. I, I, I actually think that by having to play by a set of rules and become extremely inventive, at least in my own thinking, about how to mutate and pervert and warp these rules to, to satisfy my own kind of artist or aesthetic. Uh, this has been a blast. And the reception so far from people who were not my fans prior to the series, so the wider audience, much wider audience, and the and the core fan base has been overall very, you know, it, it's been very, um, uplifting it's actually making writing the third one a lot more you know you're going to do it one way or the other but it's nice to have a wind under your you know under your wings and i, I feel that people are so excited about the second book that it's it's, it's just really validating what I'm, what I'm trying to do and giving me a lot of confidence to go okay i can i can continue to go down this path and and essentially try to write a book that satisfies the crime noir crowd but also bring in my my core fan base which loves which loves the horror aspect of my writing, and, and um, you know uh, that's a fun place to be when you're when you're working under a really crippling deadline. Uh, I don't remember where it was, but I saw you were favorably uh, compared to Lawrence Block. So, you know, I don't know if you saw that, but I yeah, yeah you know what made me really happy that that was a it was a couple it was it, I think it was the Wall Street Journal or it might it might have been the New York Times. I got two really great re reviews. And very generous reviews uh, from, from those guys. And also, um, Bruce DeSilva gave a for the Associated Press. Not only did the reviewer compare me to Block, which is really humbling, but he also, it was like, it's as much Lawrence or uh, Bram Stoker as it is Lawrence Block. And I was just like, Yeah, yeah that, it was. I, I tell you, that is something you talk about how you want to be read. You know, and he could have said he could have said Elroy, or he could have said there's so many great writers, John D. McDonald, who I, whom I really admire. But you take someone who's known for this really meticulous, beautiful craftsmanship within their within their preferred genre, right, or the genre they're famous for. But then to transpose it with the place where I'm coming from, you know, I'm I'm the I'm the newcomer, you know, from horror, and and, and yet it's not a horror novel. That was really valuable. If it was a horror novel, I would have been like, oh, that's great. But I'm trying to reach a much wider audience, and I was really thrilled because, in a way, it's validating the horror pedigree that I have, or the horror DNA. It's like saying, "Hey, this can be, this can be taken seriously within this genre. It's not, it's not tourism or something like that. There's, there's somebody out there that's trying to bring these together in a way, though, that's not trying to basically try to pull one over on you or turn it into something it's not. This really is a this really is a mystery. This really is a legitimate crime novel or series. It's just that there are these other echoes in it, these ghosts. And I, I, I was really thrilled to get that notice. I tell you. 
Yeah, well, that was. I, I was gonna say Maya Tremblay loved the two books, Laird. She reported back this weekend. Oh wow, cool. <laughs> but no, I, I've been hearing from you know older uh, fans, you know, people who've read. I matter of fact, that was one of the other books I'm reading uh, is a Bullet for Cinderella, which I had never. It's a John. It's like a novella, uh, mm -hmm. or a very very short novel. But some of the greatest like data points that I've gotten that really makes me happy are from all these uh, hardcore. You know, people who came up reading uh, the greats, you know, their, their hero was, Mal you know, Marlowe or, or Hammer or somebody like that, or Parker. Uh, oh, Spencer, he's pretty good for the new guy. That crowd has really been supportive of me. And I got to tell you, that that feels really good. Well, yeah. What are those headphones, by the way? It's like freaking uh, <laughs> head, like headlights on the side when you turn. It's like, uh, it's low. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> are those your gamer headphones? No, these are uh, for years. I had uh, just like the four dollar, six dollar headphones that disappear into your ear. They're not supposed to. They, they go in there, and uh, finally, I, I, you know what? There was these were on sale, and I I got them. I just hated them though. They were just they're like hundred dollar headphones, but I got them for like twelve bucks or something. Like, this is a drastic sale, and I, I didn't like them. And so, uh, but a, but a friend of mine, or actually one of my readers, he's he's. He, he tests products out and he said, Hey, I've got keyboard, headphones, and a mouse, you know, top of the line stuff, lights, you know, beautiful. And I said, Sure, let me try them. And I'll never go back, especially with the keyboard and the and the mouse. I mean, I'll never go back. For years, I've always been the cheapest possible peripherals I could get. I will never go back to that. Uh, the reason I'm wearing these, though, is that I actually had a really nice set of headphones, but. Um, Almost went went deaf. They something went wrong with with, with them. I'm already deaf in this ear anyway, and something went wrong. And I, I got a blast of static. You know how like a a, fee, a feedback. It was so loud. I I actually tears shot out of my eye, and I, I had to tear it off my head. So oh, there you wow. go. That's the, that's the long story about my about these. These are they haven't done that to me yet. Well, Paul, I was hoping to hear an answer along the lines of, "Well, I knew I was going to be on the show today, so I ran out and got these." So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no. Uh, well, we'll wrap up in a couple of minutes here. But um, uh, same question with movies and TV. What do you? What have you guys been watching uh, that that you really really like? Okay, I'll start. I am digging uh, "Too Old to Die Young" by Reffin, and I got I got also say uh, Brubaker. Uh, I've read like a tiny bit of Brubaker, but I've been giving Ref and all the credit, and somebody said, "Hey, Brubaker, this, I guess he's a graphic novelist generally." But oh my God, it's fantastic! But I will say this: it's fantastic for a minority of people. I do not think, and and this this also this also includes people who who gen, generally like more difficult or challenging stuff. It's difficult and it's challenging, and it's very um, almost about belligerent or bellicose and how and how it's filmed so i don't necessarily say it as a recommendation for the average person listening to this or watching this but it if you have the patience for it and you it, it's absolutely it's one of the better things i've seen in a long time and it occurred to me i've watched the first five episodes and that's like nine hours so far i mean each episode's an hour and a half long um like the short one was like an hour and five minutes or something and the long was like an hour and 40 so far so they're like almost like mini movies and they're commercial free, obviously. But one thing that it occurred to me, and this goes for, for most of his stuff, but goes double for this, is you can't watch, you can't watch Reffin's material like you would a regular regular show. And, I, and it doesn't matter how much critical acumen you bring into it or academia or whatever. It doesn't, your experience doesn't really matter because this isn't about how movie smart you are, film smart you may be. This has to do with, it's almost like a fight. There's a certain level of grappling. You actually grapple with this stuff, not in the messages, but in how it's packaged, how it's executed, how it's filmed, the repetition of the tracking shots. He does a lot of panning in it. There's all these things. It's stylized. The characters don't talk, they emote. There, there's like this general stylized nature, like almost hyper stylized nature to it. And so if you watch it, with any kind of David Fincher esque sort of expectation, like quick, you know, his, his old music video kind of thing, where things happen at a certain uh, clip, 
even Breaking Bad, which which had its moments of, of vast silence and lights and colors, there was a rhythm, there was a there was a recognizable rhythm to it if you watched a couple a couple of those episodes. You you knew you got what, what the filmmakers were doing. This is different. I don't think people are I don't think that a lot of people have experience with this kind of thing. I certainly certainly didn't, and I've watched a lot of trippy stuff, foreign films and whatnot, and I've watched a lot of reppin. And this is all about um, you have to toss your expectations. If you hope to enjoy it, you really do have to set your expectations aside and just accept it on its own terms. But it's a wonderful amalgamation of noir, crime, thriller, mystery, and I would say to some degree horror, uh, not... I haven't noticed anything supernatural, although it's heavily occult or mystical. Uh, and I, I give it just through through five episodes. For those who will who will appreciate it, it's it's probably five out of five stars. Everybody else, your mileage is going to vary, but it, it is beautiful. I think everybody can agree with that. So our friend in South Texas who probably stopped listening like forty five minutes ago. <laughs> I have listened to the show. It's not uh, Paul, uh, what about you? Uh, so speaking of things that are not for everybody, uh, I watched the movie on Shudder, which is, I love Shudder, um, the streaming service that's it's horror only. I know everyone's like, get fatigued from buying streaming services, but they've got wonderful stuff on there. I find myself watching that more than I watch Netflix, um, honestly. But, uh, so there's a movie on there called Haga Souza, um, mm. and it takes place in the 15th century, it's a German filmmaker, and actually the filmmaker, I think, did this movie... Uh, as a graduate project and like, yeah, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but they're like, wow, this is great. We're actually going to do it as, you know, present this as a movie. But uh, I'm not the first person to observe this, who have seen Haggis Susa, but like, if you thought the witch like really went too fast and was like, <laughs> yeah, just the movie. <laughs> you're, you're <gonna> no, <laughs> so I mean, it is, I mean, glacially slow, but on purpose, but it, it is like just totally mesmerizing. Just, how it's shot, it, you know, it, it does just draw you in, you know, and there is some sort of ambiguity at play, but for, for such like a arty movie, it gets, you know, the stuff that like at the end of the movie, and you're like, oh my God, it, I don't want to spoil, but like it had like these really, if I had told you like these things that happened, you would assume I was talking about sort of like a, you know, an extreme gore fest horror movie. I mean, and there's not a lot of gore, but just the things that are confronted and represented, it is just totally, utterly unnerving and disturbing. Um, equally disturbing and unnerving, uh, but in a different way was the HBO series Chernobyl, uh, which I highly recommend. It's sort of I, weird to recommend because it's a real life thing, but I'm uh, I'm about thirty minutes into the first episode and I like it already. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, some of them get to be really hard to watch, you know, especially for, you know myself growing up. You know, as a teenager, you know, I graduated high school in 1989, so the 80s for me were about, like, the fear of nuclear war. And, I, you know, as a kid, that, that was my biggest fear. I'd have so many nightmares about, you know, dying in a nuclear explosion. So I was a little worried going into watching it that it was going to sort of bring me back into that headspace. But, uh, I mean, it did a little bit. But, you know, and also, thank goodness I didn't know, like, how bad I, – I knew Chernobyl was bad as, you know, it was in 1986. I was 15. I was like, ah, oh, you know, they have it contained, or it's just going to be in, you know, the USSR. It's fine, but like, I had no idea how close it, it came to being, like a, you know, a worldwide catastrophe, essentially. Well, uh, not just that, Paul, but do you know? I I've, I don't remember the guy's name, but a Russian commander of a sub uh, refused to. It looked like the United States uh, had fired on them, on the USSR, but he didn't believe the data. He. Right refused to fire the nuclear missiles from his sub. And that decision uh, basically saved the world. The guy just died oh, yeah. and nobody really knows who he is. You know? Right. But so, yeah. you have no idea how close we came. I know, yeah. In, uh, in Chernobyl, it's only five episodes. So unlike the the 12 episodes of Refn, hour and 40 minutes each, I'm just kidding. I'm going to watch the Refn now. Uh, um, the reference show because I'm a fan of his work. Um, uh, and the last thing I would say is I just started Channel Zero season two. Um, it's also on Shutter, and, and that's you know every every season is a different thing. I didn't really connect with the first season, but I'm really liking the second season. It's called No End House. Um, 
you know, and all these are sort of based off of like creepypastas, I guess. And there was this one story about the No End House where I'll just give like the opening intro. You know, um, it opens with these like 20, 21 year olds or actually the primal like 19 or 18 because one just went off to college. One of the girls, her father had just died like in the past year. But like uh, these kids start getting like random messages on their phone about like a creepy house and it eventually it gives them an address. So all these people show up and they think it's just, oh, this is like this almost like, um, I don't know what you would call it, but like, hey, this is like a gruel at a marketing kind of thing to come like see this creepy haunted house, like this big black house is in the middle of like a suburb and all these kids go and there's six different rooms that you're supposed to go to. But like the, the, um, the, you know, the rumor is like most people quit before five and no one makes it through six and the people that have tried to make it through six have never been heard from again. But, you know, now the kids believe this. They just think it's, you know, well, part of the marketing of this place. Now I'm really glad I asked you this question because yeah. I saw some of the first season of Channel Zero and I wanted to like it, but it just yeah. lost me. So I didn't know the second season was a different storyline. And that, yeah, sounds, because, that uh, sounds like a great storyline. And so. it's funny, my, my editor's husband uh, sent me the DVDs. Like, I know you didn't like the first season, but you should watch seasons, you know, the next ones, especially season two. So it's also it's on Shutter as well. So I actually, instead of I couldn't be arsed to, to plug in the DVD, so I watched the, the streaming on my laptop the first couple. This episode not only brought to you by Mount Olive Dill Pickles, but Shutter as well. But Shutter, yeah, yeah. John, this um, episode would not be complete if I did not ask you if you like the Godzilla movie. <sighs> That, that's his impersonation that's no. of Godzilla's breath right there. Exactly. That. That's a no. Please, <laughs> wisely. Actually, I, I mean... That's okay. such a frustrated sigh. You know? so my John, that's my John impersonation, though, right there. So here's the thing, right? I, I found things in it to like very much. Um, <laughs> the the visual effects, obviously, are state-of-the-art, and, and the sort of the... The, the the mass that Godzilla, Ghidorah, all those monsters have, you know, it, it, it certainly feels real. Um, and so there's a, a way in which, the, the, okay, so the weird thing about this movie is, and I know Laird's like, oh my God, I can't believe you're gonna spend all this time talking about this. Why, you know, the uh, you're, you're gonna be like five minutes closer to death by the end of this and the, you know, for no reason, you know? Um, but okay, so, in a way, this reminds me of a of a Godzilla film from the '60s. You know, you, you you watched them when you were kids, and you were like, "Oh my God, the spectacle!" But whenever the spectacle lapsed, right, you were like, and the people were talking, you were like, "Shut up! Just let's get back to the monsters," right? And so the and and then as an adult, if you watch them with your kid, you're like, "Come on, come on, let's watch the Godzilla movie that's on." You know, you still, you can connect with some of that childhood. Oh, I love this. But you're also thinking, even the spectacle doesn't really make any sense. And and for me, I just felt like this was a movie that was kind of endless missed chances. Um, I mean, you you find out, you get revelation on revelation on revelation. There are these, these titans, right? That's what we're going to call the kaiju now because that's going to be the American name. Okay, fine. So there were these giant monsters. There's not just one of them. There's not just the two mutos. There's 17 of them, right? Um, okay. Not only that, there's this, this rival alpha predator that's actually from another freaking planet or dimension or or whatever oh and by the way there's atlantis or or some kind of so there were like all these things that i was like this is like 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 i thought to myself you know like i could imagine a movie where where you presented Ghidorah as this thing that comes from the stars from whatever and that you know our godzilla and the other monsters are they created by this or or um or accelerated in some way, developed by this Atlantean civilization as as a kind of as bioweapons to to sort of fight Ghidorah. Is is that what happens? And then um, and then ultimately they all just kind of tired each other out or something. Like there were all these possibilities, you know? But it just felt like it it just threw these things off w without really thinking about them, which I mean, here's my sweeping criticism of of so much current popular filmmaking. Um, you know, it it does that. It doesn't it doesn't pay enough attention to the writing. And here's the thing: these are fixes 
that take like two minutes. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like you could, you could tweak all of this stuff and keep many things in the movie the same, you know, it, it's not going to break your budget. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure how I felt about what happened to Fenway Park. I'll just say, I'll just say that, you know? Um, I mean, obviously the physics of what the characters go through being flung around, that's all so about. You're a friend in South Texas, shut up, you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a monster movie. But you know, now, the, I, I want Team John on this. Uh, I don't want to interrupt, uh, but I would say briefly, I think you said it to me on the phone. It, it, I mean, the writing, it felt like it screamed writer's room, like, yeah, yeah, you know, this be cool. You know, there's there's a great story about um about the the late Harlan Ellison, and I know that Harlan was a problematic figure in a lot of ways, but Harlan had no patience for this kind of stupidity. And there's a a story that um when they were kicking around ideas for the first Star Trek movie for Star Trek the Motion Picture, they had this really cool idea that Harlan had helped them come up with. And it was it was the gateway and um, the, the time gateway. And is it Gateway to Forever, I think, is the name of the episode. And what uh, was going to happen- Guardian on the Edge of Forever. That's the one, right. So what was going to happen was that there was going to be a lizard race that was going to encounter the Federation and their, you know, a, a sort of a lizard empire, star empire. And they would realize that um, in order for humanity to have arisen on Earth, it necessitated the like the dinosaurs had to die, and so this guy was gonna this this lizard guy was gonna go back in time and change things so that the Federation so that so that lizard life becomes the the dominant life on Earth, and the Federation disappears, and then you know and of course the crew of the Enterprise would not be affected by this, but then they would have this real moral dilemma because in, in restoring human civilization they would then be wiping out like this whole new civilization. That had arisen, and, and I just think, man, what a movie that would have been! Like, what a freaking Star Trek movie that would have been. So Harlan goes in, and he's having a conversation with one of the producers, and the producer's like, you know, just sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, you know, I heard that like the uh, the Aztecs built some pyramids. You know, could we do something with that? And you know, Harlan was just like, I mean, he, you can imagine what Harlan said to the guy. Oh, sure. Um, but you know, one wishes for Harlan. I mean, I mean, this is why for all of Harlan's problematic behavior. I think this is why to a certain generation of writers, he was a kind of a, a hero for, for just, you know, telling people who had these stupid ideas, you have stupid ideas. And it's, it's frustrating, I, I suppose, for us as writers, because yeah, right now on this show, we could come up with a better Godzilla movie, a better King of the Monsters movie um, in about five minutes. I mean, Nick Mamatas does this every now and again online. Nick wasn't happy, I remember, with the end of the Lost TV show. And somebody Why said, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so, you know, it was the old, well, could you do a better job? Well, and yeah. Nick, <laughs> right, and, and Nick did. He, he wrote like about like a one page little pricey and he was like, here's how it should have ended. And I was like, there you go, boom, that's, that's your answer. And I think that that's frustrating. Um, that's frustrating um, when when you imagine the yeah the amount of money that went into making that Godzilla movie, and you think those are lovely visual effects. Wow, I love the way Godzilla looks. That's great. Um, and maybe you could have done something with the story, you know. And I appreciate that. Look, if I were the director and hearing me being you know making my obnoxious comments, yeah, I would feel defensive and I would feel like you know screw you, buddy. Um, but I, I guess I just feel kind of like it's not that hard. It's not that hard to, no. to do yeah. smart storytelling. And I think that, um, look, what happened to the Godzilla movie? I mean, I guess it made its money or, or, or whatever, right? But it's gone. It's gone from the, the theaters already. Now, maybe with my or with our brilliant storytelling, it would have still been gone from the, the theaters. But um I don't know. It couldn't hurt to give it a try. Why not try quality for a change? Wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, John, you probably feel like the last Godzilla movie couldn't have used more Matthew Broderick, right? Let's. Oh, that movie. Yeah, that I love the fact. Look, the last Godzilla movie made Godzilla French. There is nothing better than the French Godzilla, <laughs> right? I mean, he was from French Guiana, right? And he wore the beret, and he's hanging out on top of the Empire State Building. He's like, yeah, maybe I'll destroy your city. Doesn't exist. No. No, the, I like Gareth Edwards Godzilla, and the one thing I know there wasn't enough Godzilla for most people's taste, but at least he showed it in daylight. Like even in this one, for all the monster fights that they had. It was raining. It was dark. You know, they never showed anything, you know, in the daylight. Um, 
And well, I was really frustrated with that. And too. Think about that. Like, what's what seems to be the like, like one of the major scenes in the movie. This whole battle of uh, Washington D.C. You get in like a two second clip, and and they're like, oh, we had to evacuate Washington D.C. The monsters have destroyed it. What? You know, now I I. I'm sure they were like, well, we're going to have a big battle in Boston, so we have to get rid of the, we, we can't do too much in D.C. But I mean, ah, oh, it's painful. It hurts. It hurts. And I guess it hurts because you, you just you think it's not that hard. It is not that hard. Yeah. Well, it's hard, but just less people. Less people in the room. Let two yeah, people right, yeah. Yeah. play. Yeah, producers go away anyway. Sorry, Laird's been conspicuously quiet. Laird's like, this is this is a waste of my time. <laughs> I, died, I died five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I, I got home from seeing Godzilla with my daughter, and she actually she was funny. She didn't like it either. And I texted my brother, who's five years younger. Um, I said, yeah, and it's like, God, ah, didn't you not like it too? And he got so pissed, like we were at like a yelling match on the phone. And right away, he was like, you're a horror hipster. You don't like anything. I'm like, whoa, whoa. What's a horror hipster? You don't, have to, you don't have to be a horror hipster. You don't have to be anything. I mean, to have the Japanese guy detonate the atomic or the nuclear weapon. I, I mean, good Lord. I mean, you want to talk about tone deaf. I, I mean... That just blew my mind, you know? I mean, no wonder uh, Ken Watanabe wanted to die. He was like, you just kill me. Just take me out of the series. Fine, if I got to detonate the nuclear bomb, that's fine. But completely culturally, I mean, it's beyond culturally insensitive, you know? Yeah. About Godzilla, it's cool. No, it wasn't cool. Sorry. Well, you guys have convinced me that I won't be watching Godzilla, even if it comes... Free on Netflix. So. Or to Shudder, yeah. Shudder, yeah. <laughs> Shudder. Uh, well, guys, I really appreciate you coming on the show today and, and hanging out and talking to me. So, Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we've settled the question of who would win the fight, but, you know, that may just be something every time one of us is being interviewed from now on. That's right. That's right. Uh, Paul, oh, is your collection, did it just come out or is it about to come out? Uh, July 2nd, so a week from Tuesday. Okay, what's well, the title? It's, it's called Growing Things and Other Stories. Okay. And then, Laird, the titles of your two new crime novels? Uh, Blood Standard and Black Mountain. And, John, I should know this, but, I, but I'm. it's been a long day. What? What's your most recent book? So oh, I've got a collection out called Sephira and Other Betrayers. Oh, that's right. I, in fact, I interviewed you about it. <laughs> It was a. I mean, that's it's a forgettable book, is. Mike. That's I get it. It's okay. It's fine. <laughs> oh, also, so, um, forgetting. Sorry, but also the same day, the the paperback for Cabinet at the End of the World comes out on July second as well. Oh, I awesome. probably have a few of those sold. Great, yeah, please, somebody. Well, um, I imagine most of the people watching and or listening to this know who you guys are. But for, if if someone is listening does not, all three of these guys are awesome. They're great writers and. Even more importantly, they're great guys. So thanks for being on the show today, guys. Hey, thanks so much. All right. Have a good night. You too. Thanks. Bye. You too.